I'm Don Anthony. I'm president of USA Fencing. And, uh oh, I might have a couple of friends in here. Thank you. Very nice. I paid this crowd very well, very well. <laughs> I, oh, I do have friends here. Um, this class of inductees is uh, very special, um, as all of our classes are. Uh, but I also think it's very special to uh, many of the people here and also to our organization. It speaks to the uh, level of excellence that USA Fencing has been producing, both from a longevity standpoint as well as recently. And many of those who are being inducted who are here are close friends to many of us and have done so much to make USA Fencing the great fencing power that it is today. I have the honor to introduce our historian, Mr. Andy Shaw, who's also the greatest dresser on the planet. Uh, so tonight we have a very unusual situation of a brother and a sister going into the Hall of Fame together. Now, I'm sure you all know that we have four married couples who are in the Hall of Fame. That's in your now a few of them got divorced early, but they're four, they were married at some point. Okay. And you know that Warren Dow and Helena Mrochkovska Dow are married, and they're both in the Hall of Fame. And we have another other couples, Gay and Michael DeSaro, and Carla Mae Richards and Ed Richards. And Joseph Vince married his prettiest student at his club, much like other coaches have done. And uh, Marion Lloyd Vince. That wasn't meant nasty. I was just this. OK. And then, of course, there are two sets of brothers in the Hall of Fame. Uh, the De Caprillis brothers. You know, Mike De Caprillis was the president of the FIE. Many people don't know that we had an American who was the president of the FIE, but we did. And his brother Joe, of course it was Miguel and Jose, but Mike and Joe, because people in America can't pronounce any names, so they changed their names. So then, of course, there's the Costello brothers, all right? And then there's only one. There are two sets of fathers and sons in the Hall of Fame. You know, uh, Clovis de Ladrier and Andre de Ladrier. And many, many people from Belgium came to the United States from early 1900s, that period of time. And we have one set of sisters in the Hall of Fame. First Felicia went in, not very long ago, and then Iris went in. That's the Zimmerman sisters. So for those of you who are under the age of 12, that was just for you guys. Felicia and Iris Zimmerman. So, and now we have the first ever brother and sister going in. So we have some interesting dynamics and statistics about fencing. And now on to the inductees. Okay, our first inductee came to the United States. I had an artist draw this because the only pictures of him were not very good. So I had an artist redo him to make it a little bit better. And his name is Hippolyta Nicholas. And he was from Prussia. And when you hear how he taught fencing, you might think, Ugh, do we have to put him in? OK. So we didn't believe in lunging. OK. Not that great on that part. He came over, and Charles Decay, who founded the New York Fencers Club, he was an art critic for the New York Times. And he founded the Fencers Club. And he knew all these artists and famous people in the arts in New York. And they were all ready for a fencing club in 1883. They opened it. And they hired him. And this is what part of the club looked like. You know, in the early days, the Fencers Club had shooting and fencing. So one of the things that helped to make fencing popular was that he would start people. First day, you walk in, he'd give you a weapon, and he'd start you hitting people fast and aggressive. He was not into making people look very good. And he encouraged extreme aggression and speed. So his people were feared to some degree. Rightly so. And they would just kind of charge at you. And we have coaches that do that today. Um, 
they're not here tonight, but you know, we do that sometimes. So, the thing that really made the Fenchers Club so popular, though, at the time was their membership tripled because at the end of every night of workout, he was a chef and he would cook the most amazing meals, elaborate meals, and people loved it. And this went on. Aggressive fencing right away, right into it, and then food. Very popular until 1888, five years later. And we had our first national championships because the Amateur Athletic Union was founded in 1888 in the New York Athletic Club. And they decided to start national championships in these sports because sports were building popularity. And what happened was this Frenchman named Regis Senec, his students at Sal Senec murdered all of Hippolyta Nicholas's, Nicholas's people. Well, so the Fenchers Club people were starting to want to get better than that. They didn't want to lose. So he resigned. People were not happy with him. But he started the biggest club going on in New York for those years. He also had a very public feud with the coach at the New York Athletic Club. I'm sure you're shocked to hear that two clubs could be angry with each other. It's amazing with our community. And it got so public and fencing was then covered. Their feud was covered in the New York Times. I brought one of the articles here over there of the feud between Prof Professor Jacoby and they actually were going to try to kill each other. It got a little upset. So if you feel like reading it over there. So I want to salute the first great coach, the most aggressive coach we ever had at the Fenchers Club. Oh, and by the way, once he resigned, he opened his own club right off 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, a beautiful little club. And he had this man come over who was, I think, a physician. And they were working out. And the guy broke his blade and stabbed Mr. Nicholas in the shoulder. And Nicholas fainted, fell down, and he died. Now, it seemed to be a heart attack. But what did the police do? This is in 1898. They arrested the doctor on charges of possible murder. But he was later cleared when the doctor said, no, it was a heart attack. The blood did it. So congratulations to Hippolyta Nicholas in the Hall of Fame for fencing. <laughs> Our next inductee is a much more interesting story, actually. <clears throat> His name is Alec Hearn. He read all these fencing books and felt that the things they say in there were not correct. He felt that the fencing book said, faint with the arm, and he watched the best fencers, even though he didn't add a fence. He thought the best fencers really fainted with the body and the arm. He felt that the body was the way to go. He also didn't like the way we were teaching beats, all of our coaches. He said that they were doing the beats. I know for some of you who don't fence, this might be interesting, but we were teaching people to beat the blade more with our fort against the foible or parry with that and beat that way or maybe beat the foible to foible. He didn't like that. He thought the way to do it was to beat with the foible of your blade against the fort of their blade and ricochet right off it quickly to the body. He felt that the tip being high took too long to beat attack to the body. So he started to develop what called the American School of Fencing. But he really knew he didn't know terminology. He was just thinking about it. He loved watching fencing. So what he did was he went to the newsstand at the corner, and he bought the red cover, the red series, of Spalding books. You know, Spalding's sporting stores were all over the United States from the late 1890s through the 1920s and early 30s. And every sporting goods store for Spalding sold baseball stuff and fencing equipment, including the red cover series of all the sports, including fencing. So he got the book by Regis Senac, the guy that was beating up on the Fenchers Club, and his son, Louis Senec. So he bought the Senec and Senec red cover series of books, which I own three of these. Okay, and they were 25 cents, I think. And he got it at the newsstand. I think he could put it there, at around in the Upper West Side. And this is in the 1920s now. And he started to read it and decided how he wanted to do things. Then he went to Senec's club on 72nd Street on the West Side. It was next to a house of ill repute, okay, next door to that. And Louis Senec, unfortunately, was getting drunk all the time. So even though he was a student, he'd take the new people and show them stuff. Now, the WPA starts. For those of you under the age of 13, that's the Works Progress Administration. 
that came about during the Depression under FDR. So the West Side Highway was part of the WPA, and part of the WPA was to set up fencing instruction all over New York in settlement houses, YMCAs, and other places where like orphans were living and stuff. So he saw it in the New York paper, I think it was the Herald Tribune, and he applied for the job, even though he really didn't know much about fencing. He'd read the book and he took a few lessons over for Cenex, and he got the job. So now he's teaching fencing at these settlement houses, YMCAs, orphanages, all over New York, and from 1929 to 1933. Like, now while he's doing this, all of a sudden, the US Fencing Association, the Amateur Fencers League of America, says we're going to give a prize to whoever wins the whole New York City WPA. Whoever wins it will give them a, a membership card to our organization. Well, you know, for the first 15, 20 years of our organization, the only way you could become a member was to be suggested by a board member of fencing and seconded by another person of good standing to make sure that you're somebody we want in. Of course, there were a number of people who were not allowed in. They didn't want really people of my background, which is fine, it's okay. And there are other people they didn't really want in. Meanwhile, he's going around teaching fencing all over town. The person who wins the tournament, okay, and her name was um, Miss Barker, okay, Violet Barker. She was a hairdresser in Harlem. And she learned defense at the Harlem YMCA. She wins the whole city tournament. Well, they send her in the mail. They hear that she won, so they send a card. She shows up at the Fencers Club for a tournament. It says novice tournament, so she shows up. She's greeted at the Fencers Club, and again, I like the Fencers Club, but I'm just giving you a little history. The Fencers Club looked at her, and she looked black to them. So they said, I'm sorry, but this tournament is only open to members of the Amateur Fences League of America. And I know who said this, but I'm not gonna bring their family into this right now, I'm so sorry. So, so she says, oh, I am a member. And this gentleman says, oh really? Prove it. She pulls out her AFLA card, and he goes and rips it in pieces right at the front door. And that was at West 55, East 53rd Street. You know, 320, anyway. So, she goes, he goes, no, you're not. Well, her coach decided to file a lawsuit against the AFLA. And it got all kinds of crazy, and people were saying, no, no, no. She refused. She never would fence again. She had nothing to do with it. She left. And she would not testify. So they dropped the lawsuit. But things were brewing now for the leaders of our association of how are we going to make this more open? We don't want to get into this again. So things started to brew. Now, her later trained Abu Axelrod, taught him this method of beating the blade at the fort. Albie went in to win four national titles. He took second eight times in America to eight different people. And if you asked Albie about his titles, he didn't care about them. But those eight times, those people should never have won, including Carl Borak. Where are you, Carl? Carl won one of those eight times. He said that he took drugs that night Albie, because he had a headache and a backache, and he woke up, he couldn't even stay awake, he only took second. <laughs> so, he trained, and then he opened his fencing club on 14th Street next to the Armory, the American School of Fencing. And what happened was, the New York clubs ridiculed him because his club was open to many people. He had a very hard life, but he admitted when he was old, he died a few years back, that he was not very nice, although he did support a lot of people in New York, he was very nasty to a lot of coaches, undermined them and talked ill of them. He felt that he didn't behave very nicely. But we're inducting him into the Hall of Fame for all of what he did. So we thank Ella Kern for his efforts on behalf of fencing in New York. And now is Boris here? Boris Faxman, is he here? Boris Faxman is not here. Okay. Well, that's not a problem. I'm just going to read this bio of our next inductee. Another Fencers Club member is being inducted in the Hall of Fame. 
It's Joey Melcher. Jamie learned defense when he was a freshman at Columbia. And he was known for very classical, beautiful fencing. He is also known later in life for because he became very successful with his company called Balestra Investments. And he became very successful. In fact, once when I called him, you know a man's making a real living when, when the water is running on him in the shower. He answered the phone in the shower. That's when you know somebody's really making a lot of money or living in the street, one or the other. And he went, of course, to win two national epic titles. He was, of course, an Olympian for the United States. I think it's 72. Yeah. He won the gold medal at the Pan Am Games. And he took a bronze medal on the World Cup circuit. A member of the world, US World Team five times. And he took the bronze medal at the first World Cups that we were doing. Martini and Rossi sponsored them all over the world. This is the Martini Rossi in London. And he was also a finalist at the Poitiers in France the same year. So this is for honoring one of our great epi fencers and one who helps to support our clubs, keeping them afloat in a lovely way. Jamie Melcher. Thanks a lot, Andy. Um, I'm here representing Ed. Ed's 93 years old. And uh, we have a little brief video of his acceptance speech. Unfortunately, from his many years of fencing, he has serious hip and knee problems and was not able to make the trip. So he sends his regrets, and uh, I see Ed on a monthly basis. And uh, he was one of my first coaches or encouragers into the sport of fencing back in 1974. And uh, I'll just say a few things about him after the video. Is the video ready? This is Ed Babel. I'm, I'm calling from my home in Westport, Connecticut, and I'm so sorry I can't be at Columbus to accept the award, uh, Fencing Hall of Fame award. I, uh, I'm an old-time fencer, and unfortunately I wore out my joints uh, after 35 years of fencing. Uh, I fenced in New York for 35 years and five years in France, France and Italy uh, under tutelage of uh, Rene Penchart, and I owe it all to him. And I just want to say hello to everybody and wish everybody good luck uh, to the next generation of U.S. fencers. So, wish you all good luck, everybody. And Ed asked, asked me to just make a few comments that, uh, in addition to what is in the brochure, uh, interesting thing about Ed is very similar to Coach Hearn. He learned to fence by, when he was a young man, and a teenager in Chicago, by reading a couple of fencing books. And then he started to work out with the club team at the University of Chicago. And uh, he was a foil fencer at that time. Then he was an illustrator for the Stars and Stripes during World War II. He shared an office with Bill Malden for three years, taught Malden his technique to uh, sketch his Willie and Joe cartoons that many of you over the age of 13 may be familiar with. Um, fenced foil. Uh, in North Africa and in France, was with Stars and Stripes in France until 47. Uh, moved to Connecticut, where he was an illustrator for many things in New York. Those of you who are members or who uh, come to the Fences Club uh, still will see many of his sketches and artwork on the walls there. Uh, the uh, artwork of portrait of Chaba Eltesh and I think Chaba Palagi and many other people were done by Ed. He was a foil fencer at the time, and Maestro Penchard suggested that because of his strength and his speed, he should take up Epe, which he did. And in addition to being uh, 13th at the 1952 games, he also was on the team for the 1956 games, but unfortunately suffered a detached retina a week before the Olympics. So he was unable to compete. Um, he also uh, was uh, many times, I think like eight times, uh, Metropolitan Division Three weapon champion, and he had many good results in, um, in that area in foil. He continued to fence foil, and he got the light out of frustrating Albie Axelrod because Albie's beats could not stop his seven parry, so Albie would get frustrated a bit with that. But uh, Ed was, I've known him since 1974. He's a very nice and generous man. 
encouraged many young fencers that he knew at the Fencers Club and at a club that he frequented in Connecticut, encouraged me to fence and uh, with both Ed and my first coach, Bronny Mirzivkovic, who's here tonight, who will be uh, recognized. That's why you see my face running around these places, so you can thank or curse those gentlemen. But I'd just like to let you know, also thank you on behalf of Ed and his family for this award. He greatly appreciates it, and uh, I will be back from the uh, competition on Wednesday, and I will be presenting him the award then. Thank you so much. To introduce our next inductee, we have a lovely gentleman who used to, when he worked in, for the school system, he would have kids brought in to his office from the poorest areas of his district, and he would dress up as Santa Claus, and he would personally buy presents for all these kids, and bring them in there, ship in these kids, and he'd give presents to all these kids from his district. A lovely man, Cal Schlick. I used to referee for a lot of his tournaments when I was young at uh, Mamaroneck High School in the New York area. And he ran all those Jeff Buchans, ah, another referee from the old days. <laughs> yes, sir. Right here. Here I had prepared myself for this moment for Albie Axelrod, but I have to give you my Axelrod story. It was a great one for me. If you watched Albie as much as I did, you noticed that if you pressured his blade a little bit and then dropped your point just below his hand where he couldn't see it, he would continue with the parry. And when he didn't find it there, he would come over here. So Cal Schlick worked hard on just pressing the blade with other people, dropping a little bit, coming back up, and going straight into six. So one night, I'm down at the Fencers Club. Hardly anybody was there. And Albie saw me and said, hey, Cal, let's have, a, let's have a little practice bout, knowing full well that he would cream me five to nothing. Um, and I knew it, too. But I used my Albie Axelrod trick on him. And I beat him five to nothing. He's looking at me. And he said, let's fence another bout. I said, Albie, I will never fence you again. <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> Taking nothing away from Albie, he was a great fencer. Um, I would call your attention to the booklet, page seven, when you get a chance, because it's part of my speech about tickles. Now, Dick and I go back a long, long time. Uh, and uh, I've been living with Dick for the last two months. He's been with me morning, noon, and night. Because I was trying to say, what can I say about Dick? That either hasn't been said or uh, that would, be, would not possibly be appropriate. But... Uh, I said to myself, look, just talk about the man. So let me begin by introducing Dick Olds to you from my vantage point. It was in the fall of 1952 that he answered the call for those Johns Hopkins University students to, who wanted to be members of the fencing team to show up and for their first meeting with their coaches, John Pope and Cal Schlick. Both were recent GI Bill graduates of Hopkins. Each of us came with a modest amount of coaching experience. John had fenced at St. John's College in uh, Annapolis. And I had been John's pupil for um, my stint uh, at uh, Hopkins. And uh, then I became his assistant coach. In the group that we, we met that day was a stocky, 
curly haired, um, very quiet young man who sat on the corner of this team. Um, it was Richard Olds. Uh, our brief introduction to them uh, included a warning about uh, they're entering a sport that required um, deferred gratification and demanded a great deal of, of physical and mental effort. Well, half the students left at that point. Uh, throughout that orientation, this young man just sat there quietly. Little did we know that that would be his sig signature. He would be quiet and he'd have a very sm small smile. His written form indicated that he was matriculating at both Johns Hopkins and the conservatory, uh, Peabody Conservatory of Music. I think he was the only one that ever did that at Hopkins. He recalled later to me that he was intrigued by the, the sword play that he saw and the sound of it. And uh, he was also enamored with uh, the, the swashbuckler um, uh, films that uh, were prevalent in that period of our lives. And it wasn't long after that that he had obtained sufficient amount of fencing to have beaten those people. But once the, the practices started, he was the last to he was the last one to depart, and he practiced. He was the first one there. He never complained. He rarely attempted to communicate orally. He was not in any way flamboyant or especially aggressive, and simply blended in with the team activity. Gradually, he became the master of those rudiments of epe fencing. The space set aside for fencing practice also contained weightlifting equipment for the very few weightlifters at Hopkins, we rigged a hanging golf ball in a, in a corner for the Epe fencers. Deservedly because in his senior year he became the Middle Atlantic Conference Epe champion. The fact that Dick rarely spoke nor asked questions is central to who he was in his early years. He seemed content to be a spoke in the wheel. If you ever watched the film The King's Speech, you would immediately know the reason. Dick, Roll, Dick was um, suffering from a debilitating speech impediment. Fencing became one vehicle for Dick to find his voice. Another vehicle was in his music. He was an accomplished pianist and possessed a delightful folk singing voice. I found out in later years that People with those kind of impediments, when they sing, they don't have it. It's amazing. Dick had a special relationship with his students and expected a lot from them. They recognized that he had their best interests at heart, and they in turn valued the direction he supplied. They knew that they had the honor and privilege of being introduced and inducted into the beloved sport by a man whose spirit and concern had a huge impact on their adult lives. Students agreed with Coach, possessing the ability to match their personalities to a given weapon. He helped them to understand the complexities of fencing, appreciate the subtleties of the sport, and achieve success at the highest level. In addition to coaching at Hopkins, he was also started a tri-weapon boys club so that numerous young, youngsters could enter the sport at an early age. He founded the Sal Plus, a club for adult fencers. At his untimely death, he was directing both teams. Dick made other significant contributions to the fencing scene. For many years, he was the chairperson of the Maryland Division and as such organized and supervised local competitions, conducted clinics and competitions through the Boys Club. He was a major contributor at the coaches certification programs and was on the accreditation board of the United States Fencing Coaches Association. Dick devoted his life to fencing but never sought attention 
or recognition for the things he did. Throughout our coaching careers, we shared stories and consulted each other. And I truly benefited from his counsel. Each and every year at Christmas time, he invited the fencing coach at William and Mary, the fencing coach at the Naval Academy, and me to his lunch to a luncheon at his home where we scored verbal touches and each on well, each other and reminisced about Bout's fence long ago. All of these men have died, two of them in tragic accidents. Dick's passing created a vast hole in my life. Indeed, I was in shock and devastated at his unexpected death on a dark, snowy night on an isolated rural road. Dick modeled for those around him the meaning of honesty, commitment, and sportsmanship. Dick epitomized the notion, or notion of doing my way. That was his way. He wore a sweatsuit in winter and basketball shorts in warm weather. Regardless of the event or the gathering, his gentle care of his elderly mother, his beat up yellow Ford Festiva car that must have had the mileage of a hundred trips around the globe, his big beloved dog Lessig, his love of opera, which I shared, and classical music were important components of his world. Playing his piano was a source of great relaxation for him. He and his ukulele were well known fixtures in local coffee houses. He never studied as I stuttered when he sang, as I said before. He fought that stutter throughout his life and succeeded in touching a stammer-free speech that was his own version of the king's speech. When he was inducted in the JHU Hall of Fame, I was there that night. That was the night when he conquered his greatest challenge, much to the amazement and joy of his friends. He must have practiced that speech a thousand times before he stood before that audience. Throughout his life, Dick helped young people to learn the lessons of life through his teaching. Memories of lessons about self-reliance and other life skills are common among his former students. One former student said, coach taught more than fencing. He taught life. He taught you what was right, what was wrong, and what was fair. He always had a strict rule on fairness. And no one, and no complaining. And take what you get and use it. Dick had a solid, respectable foundation. And he wanted you to grow up to be that kind of person. So I close with Dick's last lesson for all of us on that dark road that our physical universe, each and every one of us, is suspended on a slender thready thread, a very single slender thread. And I remember right now his small smile, and I, he deeply deserves being recognized as a member of the United States Fencing Association Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. Cal, before you leave, Michael, oh, could you guys come on up? We have his family to accept. Hi, my name is Carl Liggio. This is uh, Kathy Martin Knowles, Kathy Knowles Martin, uh, coach's niece. Uh, I had the honor of fencing under Dick Knowles when he, uh, and by his side as a coach, while my time as a student at Johns Hopkins. On behalf of the family and representing the Johns Hopkins alumni, I've been asked to speak on coach's behalf.
As Cal Schlick mentioned, Dick Oles was a modest man. He shunned the spotlight. Accepting his induction into the Fencing Hall of Fame would be greatly appreciated, at the same time very humbling, and arguably make him uncomfortable. Internally, he would be beaming. Externally, he'd want none of it. No doubt, he would be honored. Coach used to say often, never cast pearls before swine. If there's one thing he was most proud, it was turning swine into pearls. He loved to take a scrappy, sometimes hopelessly non-athletic college freshman, and by their junior or senior year, turn them into competitive fencers at a level that could, be best, that could best others with high school experience. This is his greatest honor and his legacy. In our opinions, put him into the US Fencing Hall of Fame. We only wish he could be here himself and not just in spirit. If Coach were up here today, he would talk about how he was an accidental fencer, an accidental fencing coach, and then spend a good deal of time talking about how the sport has changed since he started in the 1950s. I only hope he would recognize how instrumental he was in the sports development in the United States. Many of his students have continued to fence post-college and help teach and build programs throughout the country. Back in the day, it was, used to be much easier to build a competitive colle collegiate fencer from scratch. There are other programs that did and did it well. There are programs, they were the programs he respected the most. His close friend and rival, Pete Konomikas at William & Mary, is one of many coaches and programs he considered in his peer group. He did not think highly of programs that were recruiters, managers of individual egos, teams with no structure or camaraderie. To him, it was about the program. A life program that turned boys into men. He created teammates, gentlemen, sportsmen with a dignity where everything had to be earned through hard work and puddles of sweat. Corners could not be cut. There was no easy way out. To many of us, he taught more than just fencing. If coach were here, he would opine further on the state of fencing and society in general. Perhaps his biggest complaint he had with modern collegiate fencing is it became more about the individual and less about the squad and team. It disappointed him when he saw teams without structure, discipline, and cohesiveness, made up individuals of individuals who acted like, in his opinion, he would say, spoiled brats. To him, the team came first. You had to cheer your teammates on until the last person stopped fencing. Only then could you eat, change, or rest. For those who did not know Coach, he was tough. For many people, uh, sorry, he was tough. Not many people put up with his expectations. He was part, fa part father, part motivator, part antagonist, a complete fencing master. The result was a program with decades of success, always as the underdog. Part of his legacy at Johns Hopkins was creating a team and a family which transcends every four-year generation. Many of us are closer to some of our alumni teammates than we were to our own teammates, all because of him. I conclude. Coach Liv vicariously through his fencers, especially the ones he built. He would dedicate his induction, his induction to his students, for they made him the coach and they made him proud. The men in the Hopkins team and the boys in his tri-weapons club were the children he never had. So with all that in mind, coach would offer a heartfelt thank you. This recognition from the sport who he dedicated his life means a lot. And now John Anthony will introduce our next inductee. When I was a young fencer, there were many legends in our sport. Domestically, we had Peter Westbrook. He had already made his mark on fencing both nationally and internationally. I had the great fortune of going on to have Peter as a teammate and getting to know him as a close friend. There's another gentleman in this room who was also a legend at that time. And it's my honor to introduce him tonight, Vladimir Nazlimov. There's also a lot of pressure that comes with introducing a legend. When I was just starting to come up, I heard many stories of a uh, coach. And by the time I started competing internationally, he had retired. But his prowess as one of the greatest fencers that ever lived was firmly established, both because of his prowess on the strip and his accomplishment. 
and they were significant. He has six Olympic medals, three of them gold. He has 10 world championship titles. And he's been named as the best fencer of the year twice by the International Fencing Federation. That is a significant accomplishment in and of itself. But there's more to the story. What he was even more renowned for was both his class, his integrity, and his fierce competitiveness. One of the early stories that I heard was when he was fencing in the world championships, fencing a great fencer of that time, Aldo Montano. It was for the finals in the gold medal bout. They came together, the referees didn't have a clue, didn't know where the touch was. Coach raised his hand, acknowledged the touch, shook his hand, and Mr. Aldo Montano was now the world champion. That was dry saber, which means there didn't even have to be a touch, but that was the integrity of the man that we are introducing into our Hall of Fame tonight. When Vladimir, I had the chance to meet him for the first time, we were in Germany. We were there for the Seven Nations Cup. And the nice thing about that is it's between a couple of competitions, so the seven top teams in the world get to train together. So as the US team, our coach, Chaba Altesh, was a little bit senior. He wasn't necessarily, each team led the practice one day. Chaba wasn't necessarily going to do it. So Vladimir led both the practice for the US team and the practice for the Soviet team at that time. Well, after those, that day of practice, one, I was completely dead. But even more than that, I was just completely impressed with both the man, his work ethic, and how he leads teams. And I knew he was the real deal, but I also understood why the Soviet team was the best in the world. I had the good fortune later to be one of the people in the United States when the world was completely shocked seven years later that the great coach who had been running the Soviet program was leaving. But he wasn't leaving to go someplace expected. He shocked the world by going to Kansas City, Missouri. Not a hotbed of fencing, in case any of you didn't realize that. <laughs> coach went there. He established a very successful inner city program in the Kansas City School District. Many of those individuals whose lives he touched are here today. And many of them went on to be champions, world team members, including Terrence Lasker, who was in the back here, as well as Kelly Williams, who is a world champion. I'm going to digress a little bit and just tell one of those stories that you just have to sort of include. So Coach got to the United States, didn't speak much English at all, was in the inner city. So Coach, being the trusting individual, loves the kids, is working with the kids, the kids tell him, OK, Coach, every morning when you come in to school, make sure that you tell everybody, F you. So coach walks in every morning <laughs> and tells people until somebody takes him aside and just says, coach, that's really not how you greet people in this country. <laughs> the other thing was that he went into an area, and I think because of his integrity and because of his background, he was able to touch these lives because those were children who needed someone who not judged them but was able to accept them and help them grow and to be the great individuals that they've turned out to be. So Coach has done his time in Kansas City. It's about time to move on. Ohio State has had a long-term coach, and they're looking for a new coach. And at that point in time, there was an athletic director who decided he wanted to get some input. That was the great football legend, Archie Griffin only two-time Heisman Trophy winner. And on the search committee, Archie said, 
asked me to be on it. He said, Don, if you were hiring somebody, who would you hire? I said, well, if I was hiring somebody, Vladimir Nazlimov would be my choice. He said, OK, let me talk to him. He talked to him. He was immediately impressed by Vladimir. And what impressed him most were two things. First, Ohio State hadn't won a national championship since 1940. Coach said, you bring me here, I'll give you a championship in five years. He was like, that's pretty aggressive. OK, let's see. And the other thing that he always tells the story of, and the coach added, and, and we will crush them. <laughs> and Archie's like, I like that. <laughs> so anytime I see Archie, Archie thanks me and says, thanks, Don, because Coach Dot only delivered a national championship. He did it in four years. And he's gone on to do that two other times. Of course, he says this is a cycle. He does it 2004, 2008, 2012. Can't get that Olympic cycle out of his system still. <laughs> and for me personally, I think one of the best things that I've ever done was bringing Vladimir Nazlimov to the city of Columbus. And that's a gift that many people in this city have thanked me for. So thank you, Coach, for coming. This part I'm going to do a little reading because, you know, when you're at the Ohio State University, you want to make sure you get it right. So as head coach of the Ohio State University, the fencing team has claimed three NCAA team championships, as I just mentioned. But not only that, the team has been in the top five 13 out of, for 13 of the last consecutive um, years. He's had six Olympians. Nine, with nine Olympic appearances, two silver medalists, and many of his uh, fencers have gone on to be both world and junior world team members. That legacy continues. I'm not going to go into all of the individual titles. Some of them are here. I see uh, Marco and I see Max and a number of the other students who have gone through. He's touched the lives of his coaches. He's touched the lives of this university and of many of us, because he coaches anybody wherever they're from, no matter if they're associated with them or not. It's my honor and my pleasure to introduce Vladimir Nazlimov to the Hall of Fame of USA Fencing. And it is a great honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a little bit hard for me, very hard, but it's shortly my life from my country, Soviet Union, where I'm very proud of my country because my mom and dad, they do, for me, everything was they can. You know, I came to the United States, it's something happen and usually too, I have to go to New York. And uh, Carla May, she knows this. They have some decision like New York Athletic Club, Fencing Club and USFA. But some last day who uh, I go to Moscow and somebody drive me to airport and he said, Vladimir, they won't fire me. It's impossible for me take this place where somebody fire. And I go to Kansas City School District. First one, I don't know what it means, school district. <laughs> because in, you know, in Soviet Union, I never see uh, like uh, five, six black kids. <laughs> in a way, I go to in December, uh, this, this school district, it's not only like 99, 97% like black kids, but it's kids with weapon, real weapon. With real drug. In a way, I first, uh, after several practice, it's Terence, uh, Sean, Jeremy, a lot of kids here. And what I say, true. I like open some trunk. 
I see Russian gun machine. <laughs> and like kids, 14 years old. It will be Reza, grab something. <laughs> like, where are you taking this? Hey, coach, if you need, let us know. <laughs> You know, it's, of course, I'm not ready for this. I live in Soviet Union. It's like a place where I have my knife from 14 years in my, guess, in my, my package. But I'm ready for this. But where is school? Where we go to from detector uh, to school? I said, what it means? What they teach me, like bad word. And the principal said, Vladimir, who teach you? and said, no, this is my, my business. I find quickly, because it's nice kids. These kids, I'm very, uh, where I feel, I feel real terrible. First, where I, I'm not ready for this. Hungry kids, they're real hungry. Other one, for like Jeremy here, Summers. White kids drive by taxi school. Black kids go to regular bus. I ask principal, what's going on, why? He said, Vladimir, don't give me a hard question. <laughs> they organized some like disaggregation program. Probably they finally, like several years, they closed this program. But the way I try, I see this nice kids. It's hard kids. They more protect me for my, all my life. Unfortunately, this program is like finally uh, dead. But what I do, like Terence or Jeremy or Sean, it's a lot of kids, like 70, 80 percent kids, they know after high school, they cannot go to college. It's for me, like I became like almost close 50 years old. For me, it's like it's kids hungry. Nobody could take care of him. After practice, somebody parents forget them. They don't drive him home. This is what now I meet in the, after several months. I think, my gosh, what I need to do? What I can do? Come back home, Russia. That's who I am. Or again, call uh, Carla May. Because Sport Illustrated uh, asked uh, this article in Sport Illustrated, why Vladimir Nazlamov in the Kansas City School District? Why like not uh, USFA or something in New York? But it's sport, give me something where it's like, if you men, can you do this? And we try to do this. And we make it for like four years. Uh, after this, where I take a program in Ohio State, what, I, what finally I won't say, because it's life. If we have responsible for children, we have to give him quality, nice motivation. If we love kids, they believe us. Next, like technique, tactic, it's different. Now, not much, like 20 years ago, kids smart here, in one day competition in Budapest, six bout, he lose, five, four, five, four, five, four, five, four. He like, he steers, he said, coach, how soon we can do? First competition we go to, like we make it several touches. Not win bout. It's 20 years ago. Now we go to World Championship Junior and Cadet, we crush everybody. <laughs> it's not real, it's real crush. <laughs> I do not much because my record in the real fencing is not much. We can do, we have serious machine. In the United States, I'm in the make it my result. It's not many people make this result in world. I am from like in Soviet Union, like, like in, if you see United States, I look like from Alaska, only South, <laughs> Russia. But wrestler, every Olympic game we win gold medal from 72, every Olympic game, one, two gold medal. How I go to fencing, nobody who knows. But they, my, Will be I fight without any technique. When I came uh, junior national team, nobody who won't teach me. 
They know what, because terrible technique. But now we have 50 states. If we have serious, more developed program, I promise you, it's my word. We can crush Europe if they have unified team. No, 50 states, no one. Like all Europe, only 43 countries. <laughs> one of this, uh, Adam Crompton, where we start uh, go to World Championships. Today, best fencer in uh, Russia, Yakimenko. For gold medal, we for uh, for make top two. Last bout, Yakimenko in the Crompton. Like Yakimenko is Yakimenko, but we know what it means. Adam, it's like nuclear weapon. <laughs> no, because it's machine. It's real machine. It's tiger. Said no one step back. Go to crush him. No, because it's my kids. I love Russia. I love Russia. I fight for Russia, for Olympic quadrennium. But if our kids are responsible for kids, go to crush him. It's not against Russia. <laughs> we want, we can. And he go to and beat him. It's last stage 4-4, four, four, and Yakimenko starts scared. Same like uh, only a little bit later, kid smart. 2004, we can be with gold medal, because with, uh, for top two, they screwed up us. We have to be somewhere ready. And for like next, next quadrennium, this is like two uh, men. This is what I mean. If we have heart, if we're ready for this, we can crush everybody. It's now uh, last period what I do in the Ohio State. It's my 15th season. It doesn't matter how old I am. If I save my motivation. I can do this. If I start to lose my motivation, I have to go away. Why now I take uh, for, because for Sabergrass, you, so you have to understand. Why now I take one of the best coach in world for my assistant? Because for Saber, not easy to find coach. Not easy. More hard. But anyway, I understand. I'm today 68 years old. I strong enough. But not here. If we are ready for this, we can do this. But now I see around only how many people for former, former Soviet Union. Stand up, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. If we came here, we have to do a great job. We have to do a great job. If we have opportunity, we cannot cheat our kids. We cannot be like, OK, I can do this. I don't want. I, or I want. I don't want. If we represent our country, we have to do 100%. Finally, for like 20 years here, I want to thank you so much, everybody, because I came to this country, and now my English is terrible. <laughs> I came to this country like normal people who live close to me, like neighborhood in Kansas City. They take care of us. They teach me. My kids teach me. First, they teach me bad word. <laughs> <laughs> After this, they real take care of me. This is for sure, it's like, like my children. I am very proud my wife because, you know, where we have an uh, athlete is we have headache. But for a uh, woman, like child, two children and a uh, husband who always travel, we win, we drink too much. We lose, we have <laughs> other headache. Because for almost now, first time I meet with uh, this lady where she make uh, nice children. 
and she do. It's because I'm sometimes camp here, camp in competition, camp competition, and she do everything. And tomorrow, some after tomorrow, granddaughter, she first Muslim of family represent United States fans and nationals. <laughs> and finally, what, what I see a future fencing for each country. It's not like, believe me, it's nothing criticized. I am now don't want anybody to criticize. It's a nice day. But only now we have strong program, strong team. But any strong team, if we have somebody leadership, it's like have to be like free four quadrennium. Free free four quadrennium president, free four quadrennium head coaches, or a team, because impossible two years and next, or four years and next and next. First year, I not yet knows what I need to do. Last year, look like I'm done. <laughs> this is what's now. If we want make serious, real program, we have a lot of talent uh, people. But we have to make a team over this, we know for sure. Four quadrennium, how long uh, can be president of the United States? Two quadrennium. For fencing, not enough. Three, four, four enough. Next, like I will be tired or like something too much. Well, I strongly believe we can have huge potential, huge potential, and I real uh, try what I can, use me, what you see, how I can be effective. Because several, like a couple of months ago, where is president uh, do announcement, uh, Vladimir, can you take uh, care of Saber? I can, but 10, 10 World Cup, it's too hard for me. Now we need young people, this for sure like free four quadrennium. But if I'm today close to 70, I have to have different place. Anyway, thank you so much. I am very proud. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Let me start by saying that, Aaron, I, I just can't tell you how I feel about not being in Columbus, Ohio at this very moment. Really, I, I just can't tell you. <laughs> well, when Aaron asked me to make her Hall of Fame introduction, I started thinking back to the first time we met 23 years ago, in the fall of 1991. She was 11 years old when her father took her to the Fences Club for the very first Westbrook Foundation Saturday program. Erin's precocious athletic ability was abundantly clear from the onset, and I knew if we could get her training on a, on a consistent basis, she was destined to become successful. Fortunately, I managed to convince her mom and dad to continue bringing her in after the PWF sessions ended. Well, one particular Saturday, she came in all excited about this youth tennis clinic that the U.S. Tennis Association had sponsored in Brooklyn. She got to meet tennis greats Arthur Ashe and Rod Laver, but the high point was the skills test that she participated in along with nearly 100 other neighborhood girls. Not surprisingly, she scored higher than any of the other girls evaluated. In fact, she was so good that representatives of the USTA actually spoke to her father about a full scholarship to the Nick Boletary uh, Tennis Academy in Bradenton, Florida. I swear you can ask Aaron, this is absolutely true. Well, considering the fact that Monica Seles, Andre Agassi, and Maria Sharapova were alumni, this is like a virtual prepaid ticket to the world of professional tennis. Naturally, I thought to myself, oh well, there goes another major talent out the door. And then I asked what I thought would be a rhetorical question. So, Aaron, what did you tell them when they offered you this scholarship? And she replied, I told them, no thank you, I really want to be a fencer. 
Well, looking back, that really wasn't what I expected to hear, but I managed to reply, that's just great, Aaron. Uh, you made a really, really good choice. Well, fortunately, I wasn't hooked up to a polygraph at the time. Well, we all know how Aaron's fencing odyssey turned out. Cadet teams, junior teams, senior national teams, Olympic teams, and a plethora of championship titles. And of course, a, a team silver medal in Beijing. Certainly an impressive array of accomplishments. But looking back, I can't help but wonder what might have happened if, in that fateful summer of 1991, Aaron had chosen a different path. So extrapolating from the national and international fencing results and rankings she achieved over the course of her career, I decided to, to indulge in this counterfactual exercise and project how her life might have turned out. If Erin Smart chose professional tennis. After two years of intensive training at the Boletari Academy, 13-year-old Erin Smart widely regarded as the most promising young prospect since Jennifer Capriati begins her career on the WTA circuit. She quickly makes her presence known in the majors with stunning upsets of several tennis legends. While Erin excels in singles, she quickly becomes equally adept in both women's and mixed doubles, frequently partnering with her less gifted older sibling. Her notoriety in the tennis world leads to significant media exposure, resulting in promotional opportunities, appearance fees, paid clinics, sponsorships, as well as her line of feminine hygiene products. Over the ensuing 20 years, her annual income grows exponentially. Erin's career earnings exceed $17 million. Well, Perhaps selfishly, I have to admit, I'm very happy Aaron, Aaron chose fencing. It gave me the opportunity to share 23 years worth of experience from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows with her and Keith and her parents, Liz and Tom. I bore witness to her coming of age under the selfless love and guidance of her mom and dad, both dear friends who I sorely miss. And Aaron, I carry their pride when I consider the type of people you and your brother have become. And that's, that's what forms the foundation of the respect I have for Aaron. It has nothing to do with the medals, teams, or titles she's amassed. It's about core values, the way she handled success, as well as adversity, and the unflagging commitment she has to the people in her life. I saw Aaron grow from an acolyte among a strong group of women fencers, perhaps the, the strongest in US history, to be a leader who guided an inexperienced young team to an unheralded Olympic result. I, I actually scoffed at her prediction that the 08 women's team would medal, but Erin made a believer of me, and more importantly, her teammates. And Erin was never a prima donna. Win or lose, she always was a humble and gracious competitor. Remarkably, I can't name a single member of the fencing community that has ever had anything bad to say about her. <laughs> and, I, and I know that had nothing to do with my influence. Erin, <laughs> has always given back to her community and sport without seeking the limelight of self-serving publicity. Her ongoing volunteerism with the, with the Westbrook Foundation and the Fencers Club has only served to enhance those institutions. And, and she's motivated by a genuine desire to do the right thing, guiding the next generation of fencers just as her predecessors and mentors guided her. And I, I'd like to believe that has something to do with my influence. But perhaps, what makes me most proud is that the sport of, of fencing never defined Aaron Smart. Many competitors who have achieved transcendent success fail to move forward with their lives. Their identities are inexorably bound up in the fanfare of ephemeral athletic accomplishments whose diminishing relevance becomes embittering. But Aaron has made a seamless transition and enjoys a full and successful professional and personal life. She embraces the future. Still, while fencing didn't define her, it did refine her. It became her vehicle for personal growth, leading to the opportunities and experiences that, that shaped her uh, to be the person that she is today. I can only hope that those generations to come follow her example.
There is, there is one more thing I, I feel obliged to say, especially since this might, might be my last opportunity to do so. When Erin was 13 years old, she went to her very first NAC in lovely South Bend, Indiana. She made the round of eight uh, in, the, in the Y15 event, and she beat the top seeded girl in the quarterfinal match. However, anticipating what looked like almost a surefire gold medal, she wound up losing to her younger FC teammate, Katie Cavan, in the round of four. Now, I, I tried to put the defeat in perspective, but she was absolutely inconsolable. Finally, I said, Erin, I guarantee you're going to have a long and successful career. And if you don't stop crying, I promise, every time you reach another milestone, I'm going to remind you of how ridiculous you look today. So, Erin, as I congratulate you for being recognized as a seminal figure in the history of American fencing, do you remember that day in South Bend, Indiana? Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Smart. Thank you. Um, I had a feeling Eric would tell the South Bend, Indiana story. I actually do still remember that match of losing to Katie Cavan. And right before that, but before I fenced Katie, I remember that I had fenced Uta Breeden, and it was a close match too. So, and I did cry a lot. <laughs> but first, I want to say thank you. Um, I'm truly honored to, to be be seen at, to, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And not only just to be inducted, but with an amazing group of fencers and coaches. I've, I've always looked up to Vladimir, always been kind of scared of Vladimir as, <laughs> as a coach. But um, I'm truly honored also to be inducted with my brother and my, my teammate, Ivan Lee. Um, and it's, it's kind of crazy. Keith, Ivan, and I have had such similar fencing careers. We, our mothers actually taught together at the same school. We went to high school together. And yeah, we all went through the, the foundation fencers club together and had many trips and everything as, as fencers. And it's, it's amazing. But um, I, I asked Eric to give my speech because Eric, uh, has been such an impact on my life. Uh, he, so Eric was, for, for those of you that don't know, he was a former president of the, the Fencers Club. And not only did he have a major impact on my fencing career, but also my, my education. It, the, the list goes on about how he's been there for myself, Keith, Ivan, our families. Um, he's been truly just a, a solid rock for us. Um, and he, he was amazing. I would always say that Eric was one of my uh, secondary coaches because he basically did so many footwork drills with us throughout the years, up from our from our youth through every Olympics, national teams, and everything. And to to my mother's relief, as a secondary coach, he he actually never charged a penny. He probably gave more of his own personal funds to our fencing than than I don't. I'm not sure who, who, who would ever do that, but he really devoted a, a great deal. But um, he traveled with us a lot, so I thought it was, it was appropriate for him to, to give my induction. But so like Eric said, Keith and I started fencing in 1991. We were the first students at the Peter Westbrook Foundation. And from the first day I started fencing, I just loved it. And I think also I loved that I got to meet Peter Westbrook. I mean, the first day, can you imagine meeting Peter Westbrook, some, a little 11 year old girl, just this, he's this huge personality. And she's just like, hey girl, you wanna start fencing? And <laughs> you know, he was just very enter, entertaining. But I, so I wanna say thank you to Peter for all of your personal support, your, your mentorship, um, your teasing, your unconditional love. 
um, and also for making an amazing group of people that are part of the, bringing together an amazing group of people that are part of the foundation that I see as family. That includes Bob Cottingham, Herbie Reno, um, Ben Bratton, Ivan Lee, Aki, the, the, the list goes on and on of the people that we, we've, we've been together with for, through all these years. And I'm also appreciative to Peter. I'm appreciative that he uh, stopped telling that same joke he used to tell about how when he first met me, he thought I was a little boy. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for stopping to tell that joke. But um, actually, the first person, my first coach actually did think I was a, a boy when I uh, started fencing because I walked over to Aladar Kogler. I was told that I had to start taking lessons with Aladar, and I never took off my mask the whole time. And at the end, he, he was speaking to my mother. He was like, oh, your, your son is very, very quick, fast reflexes and everything. And she was like, no, that's, a, that's, that's my daughter. And he's like, oh, well, even better. That's great. She, she, she'll, she'll make a great fencer. This is perfect. <laughs> So I, I worked with Aladar for over for twenty over twenty years, and um, and Aladar didn't just teach me how to fence and give me a, a strong foundation, but he also taught me yoga, meditation, relaxation techniques, sports psychology. The list goes on, and uh, stuff that I still use to this day. And um, he also taught me. Uh, all, every fencing word in Hungarian, and which was which is great. But little did I know, the, <laughs> he was probably teaching me fencing, like Hungarian fencing words, because there were times where he would leave Keith and I in Hungary for two weeks and just disappear. So <laughs> we literally would have to fend for ourselves. We were old enough at the time; our mom let us go. But you know, we're in like high school, and he would be like, "All right, go to practice." And then we wouldn't see him for a while, <laughs> but it, it, it did it did prove to be useful for us. Um, and I want to thank Aladar and George Kalambadovich for getting me into uh, Barnard and going to Columbia. Those were amazing years and um, amazing experiences that really new friends, everything that changed my life and. I loved, got to learn how to fence a lot of five touch bouts in my college career, which, which were great for the World Cups. Keith and I always joke like, thank goodness for college fencing because you do those five touch bouts over and over and over again. Once you get to a World Cup, it's like nothing. So it was a, it was a great thing. But um, next I, I wanted to, uh, to thank Bucky. Um, where's Bucky? <laughs> Bucky, I want to thank you. Um, for coaching me and helping me make two Olympic teams. I, I really appreciate that. And helping our team win a silver medal. Um, you really, it, with, you gave us a lot of guidance. We watched the videos over and over again and gave us the confidence to know that, you know, whoever we were gonna face, we knew what we had to do. So I wanna say thank you. And also, I want to thank Bucky for teaching me that it's okay to counterattack. But as long as you th throw in that false counterattack parity post. <laughs> as long as I do that, that's fine. And stay behind the line, so I just can't go forward. So I always, I always remember that. So thank you. And thank you for creating, <laughs> th <laughs> thank you for creating a powerhouse of US women's foil fencers. I, I, competed against so many and looked up to so many and without you creating these these amazing fencers I'm not sure where I'd be and the Ann Marshes Felicia Iris um, Susie Paxton Monique De Bruin Uta Breeden Sarah Walsh Susan Jennings and the list goes on but really these fencers just created a mark in US fencing and international fencing that gave me the confidence to think that I could do the same thing, and it was amazing. And I also want to thank all of my teammates over the years for giving me such great laughs, the support. Um, 
and really just a lot of fun we would have. It was, it was amazing. And of, of course, that includes Iris and Felicia and Anne, Susan, Katie Cavan, Doris, um, Carrie Coley, Kamara James, not just foil fencers, there's, and even the guys out there like Terrence and Jeremy, we had a lot of fun playing cards and Aki and Ivan. And, and even now the top fencers, even Nzinga, training with me in, these, in my final years of fencing. It was, it was amazing. And also the, the men's foils that used to kick my butt all the time in practice. So it made it a little bit easier for me when I was uh, fencing. So like uh, Jed Dupree, John Tiamkin, and Dan Kellner. And, and of course, I always have to give my special shout out to my, my Beijing teammates. Emily Cross and, and Hannah Thompson. And without them, I would have never, I don't, I don't think I would have ever stood on an Olympic podium. And they definitely had a lot of patience that day. That lot, and the, as many of you know, <laughs> those, those final moments when I sort of didn't know what was happening and I had a lead and it was slipping through my fingers. And um, I thank Mike Peterson and Jeff Buchanz for screaming at me in those final touches and trying to tell me what to do, even though I was kind of like blacked out at that point and didn't know what was, what was really going on, but just trying to hit Ida Muhammad. <laughs> but, um, and also I'd like to thank all the, the cadre that was, has, has worked with US Fencing over the years. So like Bob Blargman, Carla May Richards, um, Carl Barak, and um, my, my trainer that without him, I. Lorenzo Gonzalez, who I probably would have never been able to make it through the 2008 um, games. But finally, I want to kind of really take some time to thank my, my brother um, and my family. My brother is one of my best friends, one of my best supporters, and one of the best fencers in the world, and one of my favorite fencers to watch. So I always like to joke that I'm, I'm younger than Keith by like 18 months. And uh, I always like to, to joke because Keith wasn't a very good fencer. <laughs> when, he, when he started, it was, it, was, it was painful at times. To, 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 <laughs> it's, it's kind of, you, know, you can laugh at it now because you know, he's, you know, he's a great fencer now. But watching him go through fencing foils, he wasn't very good at foil, I would beat him. And then Alder switched him to Saber, so Thank goodness he did that, but it, it, was, it was tough. It was also tough because we had, in our living room, we had uh, two sides to our living room. One side was Keith's side, the other side was my side. And then we'd put our accomplishments on each side, so it would be our medals. And I mean, my side was filling up, like, <laughs> a lot faster than Keith did by the time I was like 17. I think at some point I started putting some of my medals on. On, on his side, but 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 as you all know, Keith kind of hit his growth spurt, turned 17, 18, finally made his junior team and started making. <laughs> it was it was tough, right? I've been watching him not make these teams, getting close, like you know, and getting close and never getting there. But obviously, he became a, an amazing fencer, and. Um, and now I, I think you can laugh. Keith has so many senior World Cup medals. I think many of our family members have of his senior World Cups. My aunt probably has a few. My grandmother, I think, uses them as paperweights now because <laughs> he, he, he just kept uh, just one result after another. I remember him calling from Russia. Did, I think he had won, won the World Cup, or, or he just he realized he became number one in the world at that point. And and my dad's like, well, what's the what's the big deal? My dad was never never my my father was never impressed with like our, our fencing results. He was like, all right, that's good. Uh, he's like, so what's what's the big deal? My kid's like, this is an expensive phone call. I'm just telling you, I'm just <laughs> became number one in in the world. But I. I want to say Keith has always been my inspiration to work harder and to achieve better results. And I'm glad that he didn't stop fencing after Athens. I know that was um, a painful time for, for him and he had to make some tough decisions if he wanted to fence again or not. And I, I'm grateful that 
I think U.S. fencing is grateful that he did not stop stop fencing at that at that point. And I want to thank the family. It, it takes really it takes a village to get get a fencer going, right? It, it's not just about the coaches; it's about your teammates, everyone. But family that sticks with you, and um, our aunt Carol's here, and my cousin Kyra fences now. And I want to. My aunt Carol has seen us fence in. Every Olympics went with us with our mother and my grandmother um, and has been there. And so I say thank you to, to you for, for being there. And then, of course, I want to thank my family that's not here, but also Keith's, Keith's wife, Shira, who went with us to to two Olympics. And and I know she never saw us fence, but Keith's, Keith's daughter, Taylor, she's a fun time. I I kind of hope she doesn't fence because having that smart USA on her LeMay or, or jacket it would be a lot of pressure. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. But, um, and also my, now I can say this because my, my fiance, uh, this is new, he, he, he's not here, but I want to thank my fiance, Andrew, who has known me post fencing, but pretends like he, he could beat me in fencing, which is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but lastly, I want to I want to thank my my late parents, um, Thomas and Audrey Smart. And words really can't explain how much they sacrificed for Keith and I in this sport. And besides getting the athletic DNA right for for both of us, but they really our parents sacrificed so much and. My, my dad just happened to be reading an article and saw that Peter was starting the foundation. And he said, you know what? I think this is, this is something you guys should try. And he had worked at Sports Illustrated for, at the time. And someone was, said, oh, yeah, fencing is a great way to get your kids into college. You should try it, definitely. My dad was like, all right, you, got, you better start trying this because you know college is expensive. So, um, But my, my mother was our number one cheerleader. She drove us to, to practice. She, she would, I'm sure she called Carla May how many times, I'm not even sure. I'm, I think she probably called Bucky a, a couple of times when sending me to Rochester and just said, no, where's Aaron gonna be staying? And um, she even one time like figured, I was, went to Germany, forgot my LeMay at home and had tracked me down. I don't know how, this is like before like internet and everything, like she had tracked me down in Germany, but she was, and sent my LeMay to me, but she, she was amazing. And she filled out our entry form. She would track our miles. She did everything. So it's all the little things. And I looked up to her and still do. And um, she had amazing power, of faith, and strength. But so our parents didn't leave, live to see Keith and I compete in Beijing. But I know that they were the angels that guided us to our silver medals. They were the ones that, I don't know, helped Keith step off the strip a little bit and turn that touch around <laughs> against Posse and Cuff. They gave me that when I just like felt like I was in a blackout phase against Ida. They were the ones I know that were guiding us. So um, I do dedicate this to my parents and thank you, thank you. Jeff Buchans, come on down. And they just said I have 30 seconds to speak now. <clears throat> Ivan, seriously. I can't tell you how honored I was when you asked me to introduce you, especially after Tim Morehouse turned you down. <laughs> Be because you were too cheap to pay his appearance fee. When you, when you asked me, your only request was that I didn't embarrass you in front of your wife, Shamika, and your family. I laughed at that request until you told me that as a New York City police officer, you're allowed to carry a gun. 
But you know what, Ivan? Shamika's not here. Your family's not here. And I sure hope your gun isn't here. And let's just say the only thing protecting you right now is that I want to maintain my USFA Life membership. Ivan the snappy dresser. Ivan, your accomplishments certainly merit being in the Hall of Fame. I know that because you've told me a hundred times. <laughs> but I have to break some news to you. Andy Shaw, hey Andy, come over here. Andy, the chairman of the nominating committee, was a well-known referee. He was well-known for being a good referee, but he was really most well-known for being a snappy dresser and wearing suits. There he is, right there. And it was because of that penchant for suits that he told me that he moved you to the front of the nominating line. Now, Ivan, you told me you own 16 suits. That's pretty impressive. And you even had one made for tonight, which is really special. But it's sort of odd that I heard you traveled 7,500 miles to Bangkok to have suits made. So let's get the math here. You live in New York City, the haberdashery can uh, place of the world, capital of the world, yet you traveled 7,500 miles to the sex capital of the world to have suits made. Okay, Ivan. <laughs> Ivan the stubborn. Your best friends have told me that you are the most stubborn man they have ever met. Right, Keith? You tell me that. <laughs> you were well known for practicing at the Fences Club wearing your warm-up suit, uh, warm-up pants. And that all changed when Jed Dupree almost had a blade go through his femoral artery and they changed it so that you'd have to wear knickers, which was smart and made sense for liability and for safety. But it didn't make sense to you. And you got into a pissing match with the executive director, Rita Finkel, and to prove your point, over your knickers, you continued to wear your sweatpants. You know, Ivan, even as a referee, heaven help the fencer who questions any of your calls. You will tell them why they're wrong. You will get on the strip while you're refereeing and demonstrate why they're wrong. And then you'll make them apologize for having the audacity to question you in the first place. <laughs> as a re result of willing to enlighten all the fences on, after every call, call. Your pools take 20 to 30 minutes longer than every other pool. And I did the calculations that at every single day, at every knack you're at, the referees finish an hour later and thereby cutting into their drinking time. <laughs> and considering that you don't drink, Ivan, that is really selfish. <laughs> Ivan, the loyal friend, and Ivan, the referee. When I assume the position, and you can take that any way you want. As team captain in 2003, my mentor Carl Borak, who I took over from, told me that no matter how good a job I did, no matter how great I was with the athletes, no matter how much time I put in, there was going to be constant complaints and backbiting. It comes with the turf. And Carl, and God bless you, Carl, you were right. I served as team captain from 2003 to 2008. And in addition to all the wonderful times, there was a never-ending stream of annoyances and backbiting. I got along with most of the athletes during those six years, some not too well, but I really learned about who the leaders were and who I can trust. Keith and Ivan always had my back. If I messed up or something was going on behind the scenes, they would tell me privately. They'd speak to me. I learned, Ivan, that you were a loyal friend, something you can't put a price tag on. And as a perfect example of this loyalty was last year's Ivy League Championships when I was head referee and Ivan was a referee. He was, he was wearing his preppy Ivy League suit, by the way. You remember that one? I noticed that one of the fencers on Ivan's strip was wearing an ankle or a knee brace outside the knickers. And for those of you that read the magazine, you see I just wrote about that. It didn't seem to matter because I saw hundreds of them wearing it today. So I went over to Ivan afterwards discreetly so as not to embarrass you. I said, Ivan, do me a favor. Before the next bout, have her take it off, whatever. And he did. And I went over to him and I said, thank you for listening to me and for enforcing the rules. And when I said that, his eyes widened, and he cracked up when he said, dude, there was no way I was going to take the hit for that. I went up to the girl, pointed over at you, and said, see the goofy guy with the big nose? He made me do it. <laughs> Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> so while we're on Ivan the Referee, quick story. As you can imagine, in order to have Hall of Fame credentials as you have, and as you've told me you have, Someone has to have a huge well of self-confidence and just a massive ego, which makes some of the gotcha moments that much more delicious, Ivan. At the NCAAs one year, um, Ivan, I was head referee, Ivan was refing. I felt the moment was right. And I went up to him and I said, Ivan, 
I spoke to most of the coaches, and there is a clear consensus that you are the second best Sabre referee here this championship. And without a blink, you said, dude, you can't be serious. Who could possibly be number one? And at that moment, I said, Ivan, all the others are tied for first. <laughs> Ivan has the longest arms in fencing. Ivan told me today he's five foot nine, but that his wingspan is six feet seven inches. But Ivan, your ego is so big, you can't even get those arms around it. <laughs> Glad you asked me, aren't you, Ivan? Okay. <laughs> Ivan the competitor. Nobody is more competitive than Ivan, whether winning meaningless bouts at the club or winning championships for the PWF. Ivan has to win at everything. He has to win at fencing. He has to win at cards. He has to win at arguments. And he even had to win at, of all things, Scrabble when we used to go on these trips. And according to Keith, Ivan might have made it to number one junior in the world, but he never made it to number one Scrabble because Harvard-educated Tib Hageman always is to kick your butt. <laughs> and Ivan didn't like it very much, and the only way he can get him back was to kick his butt at the club. <laughs> hey, here's a newsflash, Keith. I wasn't Harvard-educated, but I schooled Ivan in Scrabble, too. Okay. Ivan the volunteer. The PSAL, I was a product of the PSAL, the Public School Athletic League, which is the New York City High School Fencing League. Ivan was as well, fencing at Brooklyn Tech. A little known fact is that Ivan went into Sabre and became one of our country's greatest Sabre fencers ever. That's what you told me, right? Yeah. <laughs> was because Ivan switched from foil to Sabre. And why did he switch from foil to Sabre? Because as your good friend Keith told me, you know, Keith, it's a good thing you didn't ask Keith to give this speech. <laughs> It would have really been bad, is that you just couldn't beat all the foil guys and you got frustrated and you switched to Sabre. But on a serious note, Ivan deserves a lot of credit because he's given back to fencing. He's become the commissioner of the PSAL and the head referee assigner. And here was a program that in my time in the 70s actually almost died and you've helped keep it alive. Way to go, Ivan. That's great. <laughs> Ivan the volunteer at the PWF. Ivan is a proud member of the Peter Westbrook Foundation, the PWF, and he gives back every Saturday morning teaching the kids. And according to Keith, again, the kids are really intimidated by you because every Saturday morning you can continue to tell them about your credentials and they're just in fear of you. And because Ivan tells the kids every Saturday, they know these credentials cold. And you know something, Ivan? If Ivan Lee credentials was a big part of the SAT, all the PWF kids would get into Harvard. <laughs> Ivan the teammate. Candidly, I was stunned when I read Ivan's bio. I didn't, I didn't realize it all. Five-time national champion, number one junior ranking, Pan Am individual and team gold medals, numerous junior and senior World Cup medals, number four senior ranking, two-time NCAA champion, USOC athlete of the year, and proud Olympian. Wow, Ivan, even if Andy favored you for your suits, you really are a Hall of Famer with great credentials. But Ivan, it was your character as a teammate which, in my opinion, was your strongest suit. And you were never better a teammate than that fateful day in Athens in 2004. We all know it was the most painful day in American history, American fencing history. We lost an Olympic me medal by one touch in consecutive bouts. It was brutal. But tonight, I would like to talk about the positives of that day. In the quarterfinals, we were ranked number seven and drew number two ranked Hungary, a team we had never beaten in our history. We were the biggest of underdogs. We were given no chance to win at all. And the problem was not only was Hungary a great team that we had never beaten, when we fenced European teams and had European referees, we, were always, we had an additional, an additional problem because we just never got a close call, ever. So at the dinner the night before, um, we sat down and we made a pact. Do you remember that pact? We made a pact that no matter what happens, right from the get-go, we're not going to start bitching or belly aching. We're not going to start crying. We're just going to, whatever calls they make, we're going to fence harder. Remember that? We would not use the referees as an excuse. And sure enough, in the very first bout, Ivan led off against Ferjansik. And the one referee in the world who always gave it to us, and probably still does, was Florea of Romania. Sorry, Dan. Oh, sorry, whoever's Romanian here. Ivan lost three to five to start. Now, it's 10 years later. We wound up winning the match. I have nothing to gain by saying this, but I tell you, Ivan won that first match five to two. 
You didn't lose it three to five. We just didn't get one call. Ivan comes off the strip. We could have been rightfully deflated. And he came off shaking his head behind those electric blue glasses. Ivan wore these electric blue glasses that it's 10 years ago, but I could see today it made him look like a prehistoric bug. <laughs> and I can see it in my eyes from 10 years ago today. And you know what? If you open to page 15 of the program, you can see Ivan the prehistoric bug right now. <laughs> there he is. Ivan comes off the strip. And you know what? He had a right to be down. He just fenced great, and we're down three to five. He started becoming the number one cheerleader, and you started leading the team, and it was awesome. You wouldn't, wouldn't let us get down. And you let your saber do the talking in the next two bouts. When you beat Langiel eight to three, which completely turned the match around. Do you remember that? And then you beat Nemchek, their best fencer, six to five. Ivan finished 17 and 13, a plus four indicator, and really should have been 19 and 10, a plus nine indicator, if you'd gotten the calls in the first bout. And along with Keith, and Jason Rogers led us to beating Hungary for the very first time in our country's history. A massive, massive upset, which wound up costing their head coach their job. Without that outstanding performance against Hungary, there would have been no medal round on that day, and never forget it. Unfortunately, Ivan did not get his Olympic medal. But Ivan, you know what? I wrote a book, Closing the Distance, about trying to follow in my father Dan's Olympic fencing footsteps. It was a difficult journey, I embarked on it for 30 years. I was on a mission to duplicate all of his tangible feats. And you know what? At the end of the journey, I realized I had it all wrong. Instead of trying to match my dad's hardware, all the medals he won, I should have tried to match the software and be more like him as a person. And the same goes for you, Ivan. At the end of the day, you will never be defined by the hardware you won or didn't win. Rather, it is the love and respect of your friends and teammates that you've earned which make you a real Hall of Fame person. And with that, I introduce my friend and Hall of Famer, Ivan Lee. Jeff. That was okay. That was good. I won't strangle you. <laughs> I threatened Jeff multiple times. I said, Jeff, if you embarrass me in front of my friends and family, you need a bulletproof vest to get out of that place alive. But uh, he did all right. Shout out to Jeff. So, for those of you wondering why I uh, picked Jeff to do my uh, introduction, <coughs> it was just because of. Um, a friend that he was to me, uh, being captain of the U.S. national team uh, for several seasons. And, uh, you know, I know it was a difficult position for you because, as he said, being captain, you know, you're going to deal with some friends, uh, some fencers and some coaches that are not going to like you and some that will. Um, but, you know, I saw Jeff and I just saw a nice guy who cared and he wanted to see the fencers do well. And that was more than I could say for a lot of people that I've dealt with in this sport. So that's why I chose Jeff. Let's have a round of applause for Jeff. I'm kind of, <clears throat> I'm kind of humbled to be here, uh, getting inducted in with this amazing group of, of individuals. <clears throat> I never thought in a million years I'd be getting inducted into Hall of Fame the same night as uh, Coach Vladimir here, uh, because. You know, he was winning a world Olympic medals and world championships before I was even born. And when I started fencing, he was the national coach. And, uh, but I, I got to say something. I remember my first world championships, uh, 1998, my cadet world championships in Venezuela. And uh, I was scared out of my mind because I said, you know, this is world championships. All the best fencers in the world are here. I don't want to finish last. And uh, Vladimir, Yuri was scared. Yuri, Yuri's my coach. He's not here. Uh, I'm going to talk about him a little later. But he was, he was nervous. He was shaking. Yuri never smoked, but he was outside in front of the building smoking a cigarette. He was stressed out. <laughs> Nazimov grabs me, and 
honestly, I don't know what you said because I didn't understand your English, but I was never more pumped in my life after he finished talking to me. <laughs> just now, when he was talking just now during the speech, I was ready to go outside and get warmed up and start in the fence. <laughs> well, I mean, every time you spoke, I mean, you made, you made me feel like I could beat anybody. And I think the one thing that you said that I was able to understand is uh, you're one of the best fences in this competition. He said, and if you fence, if you fence the best that you can, you'll be in the top four today. And I ended up with a bronze medal in that event. So thank you, Vladimir. Appreciate you. Um, again, it's just an honor to be inducted the same night as you because I looked up to you. And like Aaron, I was scared of you too because I said, any guy that could, could speak English and no one understands him, but he gets people to just do everything at the drop of a dime, that's a scary dude. So, um, uh, Congratulations uh, to Aaron and Keith. These guys are my friends, you know, two of my best friends. And uh, as Aaron said, you know, we went to high school together. Keith and I went to college together. Um, our moms taught together. They worked together for several years. And uh, it's actually Liz that told my mom that you guys were uh, involved in fencing. And uh, my mom said, you know, try it. Just try it. She tried to get me into other sports. She didn't want me to be like, Every black kid who grew up in Brownsville and just played basketball, right? She wanted me to try different things. So she tried to get me into soccer. It didn't work. I kept touching the ball with my hands. That didn't work out too well. Uh, she, she tried getting me into tennis. I kept catching the ball instead of hitting it. It didn't work out too well. So um, when she started fencing, when she started me in fencing, I, something that I really enjoyed, when I started at the Peter Wessick Foundation, <clears throat> I saw these kids sitting there like with, it, stick uh, with it. if you don't like it, we'll try something else. And I tried it and, and, and I got hooked right away. I said, oh, this is fun. And of course, you know, the first thing I learned how to do was block, because I ain't trying to get hit. Just look, I don't want to end up getting cut. It looks dangerous. And Peter saw me, I'll never forget this. <laughs> I was 12 years old, 13 years old. Brother, brother, what's the matter with you, brother? You keep parenting, man, but you're not making the repost. Brother, listen, listen, brother, I'm trying to explain something to you. You keep taking a parry, but you're not making the repost. I said, I don't know what a parry is. I don't know what a repost is. I just don't want to get hit. He said, brother, you can't block. You block the man. Listen, you block the man. You got to hit him back to get the point. I said, I don't care about getting the point. I just don't want to get hit. He said. <laughs> so that was my first experience dealing with Westbrook. I'll get back to him later. Um, <clears throat> thanks to the USFA and the uh, USFA Hall of Fame, Andy Shaw, the nominated committee, uh, for nominating me. Uh, this is not something that I expected. I, it wasn't a gold mine. It wasn't something that I was reaching for, uh, you know. But when I was nominated, I was very honored. And thank you to all the membership who voted. I appreciate you. Um, it, it's really a lot more than what I ever would have expected in this sport. So thank you all. Um, so getting into my personal thank yous, I got a list. I got a long list. And then when I'm done, I'm going to talk about four people, and then I'm going to sit down. Um, First of all, I'd like to give praise to God, um, you know, from whom all blessings flow. I'm nobody without God. He created me, saved me, blessed me with a six foot seven wingspan. And, and the Bible says that uh, I will praise the Lord at all times, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I used to get teased a lot growing up about being skinny, about having long arms. And little did anybody know that he was preparing me for a Hall of Fame fencing career. And uh, I used to look funny because when we would take class pictures, you know, I would stand up and my hands would touch my knees without me bending over. And, you know, they used to make fun of me. And, uh, but I saw a lot of people get upset when I would attack them. And it looked like I was going to fall short. And I looked up and it was one light. So the message is work with what you got. You are made perfectly because you are made by God. So whatever you have, work with it. If you're short and fat, then run up and down the strip. If you're long and skinny, then reach out. If you're tall, use your, your length. If you're short, then use your speed. Work with what you have. You can still be a champion, no matter how you were made. Uh, I'd like to thank my mom. My mom, Cynthia Lee. Oh, she did everything. She sacrificed everything for me. She, she, she worked as a New York City public school teacher for 25 years, and uh, she's been texting me like every hour. Did you speak yet? Did you have the ceremony yet? Oh. Um, but she didn't matter what I needed. She was always there. And 
fortunately for me, she only had one child, so she didn't have anyone to share the attention with. It was just me. Um, I remember one time when I missed a flight for, for a World Cup, and I was stressed because I thought the flight was supposed to be at 10 p.m., but it was supposed to be at 10 a.m. So at 10 a.m., I was driving around doing something, and uh, Jason calls me, and he's like, dude, where are you? I'm like, I'm in Brooklyn, why? He says, we're at the airport, the flight's about to leave in 10 minutes. I said, what? He said, yeah, the flight's about to leave. I said, no, the flight's at 10 p.m. He said, check, check the ticket. I checked the ticket, it was, the flight was leaving in five minutes. I said, like, well, I'm not gonna make this flight. So I started to get stressed out because it was a walk up and I, was, I needed to get those points. And uh, I called my mom and I was stressed. I was like, mom, you're not gonna believe what happened. So I told her what happened. And she said, don't worry about it, I'll get you a ticket. I don't know how much money she spent, but she bought a ticket that day and it was somewhere I don't know where, it was somewhere in Europe, man. It was a lot of money. And she, she just put on a credit card. She said, don't worry, you do what you got to do. She said, but you better not come back home without a medal. <laughs> um, don't remember how I did at that World Cup, but it, it, was, uh, it was in 03, so I ended up making the team, so I guess it worked out. Uh, my wife, Shamika, and my daughter, Imani, obviously I met them all post-fencing career. Um, and I wish they could be here, but... Um, you know, we have a five-month-old, she's a baby, so they're at home, and um, I'm not really thanking her for anything fencing-related, because she had nothing to do with my fencing career, but I just thank her for being a wonderful wife and mother to our daughter. <laughs> and uh, she stopped working back in November when she was about eight, eight months pregnant, and, and she's, she's the best, man. She's the best thing that ever happened to me. I traded my entire career for her. Um, so, um, babe, wherever you are, I love you. And... Uh, my daughter, Imani, this is, this is a brand new experience to me. I know Keith, he's got a daughter as well. And Adam, you got one and one on the way. Uh, you know, having, having a daughter is, is, uh, is a wonderful experience. Um, I find myself cleaning my gun a lot more often. Uh, <laughs> my, my godson actually, uh, 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 my wife babysits him from time to time, and he's, he's two. And so, you know, he plays with my daughter from time to time. And I remember one time, his father came to pick him up, and he goes, uh, he goes, his name is Liam, and he says, bye, Imani, and he gives her a kiss. And, you know, everyone in the house is like, oh, that's so cute, that's so sweet. And Jonathan, his father, is like, yeah, that's my boy, just like his daddy. You know, and I'm over there pulling on my gun, like, I'm getting a little nervous. This is, <laughs> those two-year-old two boys only after one thing, they're nasty. We're going to keep it moving. <laughs> uh, the Peter Wessel Foundation and all of their instructors. Uh, I'm going to go through this really quick because there are a lot of people. Herb Cohen, who gave me my first foil lesson, my first private lesson in foil. Rachel McGuire, who always taught me to not be a lazy waste of space. And he said that verbatim, don't be a lazy waste of space. Uh, <laughs> Dave Mandel, who wasn't an instructor at the foundation, but Dave, when he was trying to make the 96 Olympic team, never was too busy to pull me to the side and fence with me, uh, you know, for just a couple of minutes. He fence me, hey, hey kid, come here. You know, let's fence 10 touches, and then we're done. He'd give me a couple pointers, let's fence another 10, let's see if you remember what I told you. And I'd get one or two touches off an action that he reminded me of, and he said, there you go. And he, you know, just remember little things like that. Uh, Steve Mormondo, who taught me everything about the point in line, Mike DeSauro Jr., who's in the house, and some of you are probably wondering why I'm mentioning Mike DeSauro Jr. Mike DeSauro Jr. knocked me, put me into rubber charge in my first senior circuit. I'll never forget it. Uh, Jeff told him I'm very competitive. I don't forget any bouts. I remember every single. Hey, you bring up the tournament, you bring up the bout. I remember the score, the referee, how many touches they screwed me. Um, <laughs> so my first uh, Division I circuit, um, and uh, I was feeling really good, you know, I, I figured it's all about the pools, right? You do well in the pools, you get a high seed, waltz right into the finals. I had a really good pool, I ended up the top seed out of the pools, and everyone was like, who is this kid? They don't know who I am. I hadn't made him a name for myself yet, it was in 1996 or 97. And uh, in the 32, I ran into Mike DeSaul Jr. And I looked at this guy, I didn't know who he was, I had no clue that he was on the Pan Am team, Olympic calls and all this stuff. I just looked at him, I said, hey, he looks old and fat to me. I think I can kick his butt. 
and he promptly, quickly sent me to Repercharge 15 to 7, <laughs> teaching me an all important lesson. Age is just a number, experience is everything. Uh, we talked about Vladimir Nazimov, and again, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget, like I said, in, in Venezuela when he just, he, he, I don't, I still don't know what you said to me, but you had me pumped. You had me motivated to, to be the best fencer. And I, I even remember Junior Worlds in uh, Poland, my last year as a junior. Uh, he grabbed us, me, Jason, Tim Hageman, and Colin Parker, and he told the four of us, you guys are world champions. Everything he said after that is a blur. But I remember that part, and he said, you guys are the world champions. He said that to us before the gold medal bout, and he had that same thing. We fight, we crush them, the same exact facial expression. And like I said, he, the guy had me pumped, and we killed France and was able to win uh, first world championship. Thank you so much, Vladimir. Uh, Terrence Lasky and Jeremy Summers, they're both in the room. Terrence and Jeremy, where are you guys? There goes Terrence, where's Jeremy? He's over there. You guys, man. I tell the kids in my club all the time, they don't know. They have no clue. You know, they see Terrence, they think he was just a coach. They, they see Jeremy, they think he's just a medic. You guys don't know what, these, what, what they meant to me. When I was coming up, these guys were at the top, along with Aki and Keith. They were on the national team. And I wanted to be just like them. And you guys, you guys pushed me. I remember when we went to Kansas City to train, you guys kicked my butt relentlessly. And, and I wasn't much of a, I wasn't really social then. I didn't really do too much talking. I was just, you know, motiv you beat me in practice one day. I'm, I'm trying to come back and cut your throat on Tuesday. And you guys just keep beating me and beating me and beating me. Jeremy would parry me like nine, ten times. I would throw like three, four feints in there. He would just skip it, just wait. Bang, bang. I was like, oh, gosh. And, uh, but you guys motivated me. So thank you, because you just added fuel. You added fuel to my motivation. So I appreciate you guys. Let's have a round of applause for those guys, man. Jeff Salmon, who, uh, is Jeff here? There he goes, yeah, you didn't think I'd mention you, huh? Jeff, <laughs> when I didn't make the 2008 Olympic team, it was rough. It was probably the worst year of my career. I started the season second and I finished seventh. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a rough season, but um, I was able to salvage a little bit. I ended up winning nationals and I said, it's probably time for me to just leave now before I make further embarrassment of myself. Um, but Jeff gave me a job right after that. Uh, he had me uh, coach. I coached for about four or five months uh, at his club before I joined the police academy. And uh, you know that that time for me was 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 rough. You know because I was in kind of like a state of limbo. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, you know April first, that check from the USOC did not come in, so rent was still due. I was living on my own. I didn't, you know, my parents, yeah, they kicked me out early. So uh, he gave me a job, he gave me a job coaching there, and I appreciate him for it. Thank you. Let's give it up for Jeff. <laughs> and what I learned most about that time period uh, coaching is that this is not something I want to do professionally. So <laughs> thank you for helping me learn that. <laughs> I don't have the patience to coach at all. As you can probably tell, just dealing with my guys, I'd rather just scream at them while they're fencing. Uh, my teammates, Herbie, Herbie Raynaud. I mean, along with Terrence and Jeremy, probably, the, the, you know, these guys are the best, man. You know, they were great teammates. And I don't know how hard it was for them to deal with me coming up after them and, you know, becoming successful. I know I'd be upset if some little pipsqueak 16-year-old was trying to break his way through and I was on the national team and he was, you know, hacking away at all of us, trying to make results. I'd be kind of like, you know, get out of here, you know, scram, wait, till you, wait your turn. Uh, but these guys, you know, they welcomed me, man. They, they, they gave me an opportunity to train with them and work with them uh, when they really didn't have to. Um, Ahmed, Ahmed Yula, he's not here, but he and I, we were the same age, and we traveled together in numerous competitions by ourselves, no coach, uh, no parents. We would go to World Cups, to just the two of us, and we could make $250 cash last for an entire weekend in the middle of Europe. Um, 
Aki and Keith, what can I say? Aki's here, where is he? There he is, Aki and Keith. <laughs> what can I say about these guys? I mean, they, you know, they made me the fence I am today. You know, there's, you, you don't become successful without good teammates. And I learned as much as I ever could just from watching them fence. You know, Aki was not never much for words, but the way he fenced just, I, remember, I just, okay, I got to do that, okay. He parried him 12 times, okay. It just, whatever he did, I wrote down and I studied and I paid attention. Um, Keith, Keith is the man. Keith is the man. Uh, he, I'm, it's funny because I made a cadet team before he, uh, he never made one. I made my first junior team before he made one. <laughs> I still looked up to him because he was making senior teams before he was making junior teams. It's very weird. <laughs> Guy's number one in the country in the seniors and like fifth in the juniors. It made no sense to me. I didn't understand. It. But he was he's the man. And and we fenced together for two quadrennials, three quadrennials. Uh, and um, you know, I just remember the number of times we were in a hotel room, we shared a hotel, and he would just tell me, listen, you're better than that. You could beat these guys. They're not that good. Keith always said this, this phrase, and it always stuck with me. He said, when you're good, you're good. And it sounds simple, but it means so much. You know, you don't have to overthink it. You don't have to put too much thought into it. When you're good, you're good. Just let your fence speak for itself. Um, Adam Crompton. This guy is, <laughs> watching him fence is like watching a truck go down I-95 at 4 o'clock in the morning, like 90 miles an hour. And when he hits you, you just you feel like you got shot with a gun. Adam, you motivated me, man. You motivated me because he went to say he went to school at St. Benedict's, and those guys took lessons bare chested. They I probably shouldn't say that, right? Uh, they used to practice in t-shirts. I mean, you know, getting hit hard was nothing to these guys. And and Adam pushed me. He was that kid that was coming up trying to break through, and he pushed me so hard. He pushed me so hard. He pushed me because he was younger than me, and I didn't want him to take my spot. So I had to work harder to keep up with him. So thank you, Adam. Appreciate you, man. And now I'm going to talk about four people really quickly. Four men that made me the man I am today. First one is my father, Desmond Lee. He taught me how to be a man. My father, my father means everything to me. Growing up, when I was little, I wanted to be like him. By the time I was in high school, I avoided him like the plague. I learned so much by just watching how he lived his life. He never spoke much. He didn't really scream at me. You know, when he disciplined, it was very quietly. He said what he had to say, he did what he had to do, and he kept moving. But in times of adversity, I always watched how he handled himself. Uh, but the most important thing I learned from him is humility. I know that's probably a joke to a lot of you guys, because I'm very cocky. But Deep down, I really am thankful, I've always been thankful for, for my success. You know, I know that my success is not something that I accomplished on my own. It does take a village to, to bring up a fencer, and, and all the people that I mentioned, that's my village. So I'm, I'm so thankful to my father for just uh, pushing me. He, he, he's the one that convinced me to quit baseball, which I love and stick to fencing, um, and it worked out because, you know, I ended up getting a college scholarship to St. John's, and that made him so happy because I remember when he was telling me, he said, listen, you're going to college, but your mother and I don't have the money, so you're going to have to figure it out. And uh, so he motivated me in that regard. Okay. Um, Eric Rosenberg, who you heard about today, he told me how to work hard. He said, uh, you know, you, you're so lazy. You don't work hard enough. You need to do more footwork. He told me directly. It's something I need to hear. He didn't beat around the bush. And so I appreciate Eric for his volunteering footwork classes, drills, from the goodness of his heart. Yuri Gelman, my coach, couldn't be here. Yuri told me how to think. He said, it's not just fencing. You have to learn how to think. You have to understand what your opponent's doing. You have to understand how they move what they're thinking. If you get into your opponent's head, you can always defeat your opponent. So I appreciate Yuri. And lastly, and definitely not least, Mr. Peter Westbrook.
Peter, this is your Hall of Fame ceremony, bro. You got three of your students are getting inducted into the Hall of Fame today. And it's because of your vision. It's because of your sacrifice. It's because of your dedication. And if you look at all the kids in the room today, uh, you know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So um, thanks a lot, Peter. I really appreciate you. Um, for those of you who think I'm retired and think there's a chance I may come back, I'm not coming back. <laughs> but you might see me one day down the line in a veterans competition, <laughs> fencing with uh, the older guys. You never know, it might happen. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, but not like this. So uh, thank you so much. God bless you all. Have a great evening. And our final award, our final award in the Hall of Fame before we have the service awards. Uh, Peter Westbrook, please, to come up to present. Thank you. Let's hear from Peter Westbrook. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, first of all, I want to say this. It is so nice. We don't, we don't see each other too often. So it's really a pleasant thing for me to come by once a year and I see so many people. It's, a, it's, it's just life is so short and it's nice to honor people when they're in the land of the living. I've been to so many funerals all the time. And it's just so nice that we can gather and do something like this. Tomek, whenever I come to the tournament, I just love seeing your smile. I don't see you often, but when I see you, it's very special for me. This is a very special thing that we have. We don't get together too often, but just being here together is so special. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for the specialty that we share. I like to salute all the other honorees that are not here. I salute them. Uh, we honor their memories, and I salute them for their accomplishments. Natalia, I want to say something to you. You sacrifice your husband so much, so much. He's never home, and he's always in fencing. I want to congratulate you for lending us your husband. I want to congratulate you for the wonderful things that you've done. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And all the medals that Vladimir has, Vladimir has a lot of medals, a lot of medals, no question, more than anyone in this room probably combined. But to me, more important than your medals, the medals are nice, but to me, more important to me is how much you give to mankind, how much you try to make a difference, because you can have all the accolades and medals you want. To me, it means nothing if you can't share to try to encourage people. So congratulations for that. I want to say to my kids, I have three kids being honored in the Hall of Fame. For me, that's very special. It's very special, they're all my kids. And Aaron, you came to me about nine, Keith, 10 and a half, Ivan, you 10 and a half. But it's interesting, when they came to me, they worked so hard, dedicated their lives so much. But since I'm speaking about Keith, I'll focus on Keith. I remember Aaron and Ivan moved up so fast. But Keith was interesting, when he first came to us, everybody advances like this. Keith is one of the few people that used to advance, I'm not joking, like this. I said, Keith, Keith, listen, please, please, please. Keith, please. He, he, he said, I'm going forward, but not like that, please, please. So afterwards, this is, this is interesting. Afterwards, Keith got a little more skilled. He got greatly skilled. And at the point, we were still training me, uh, Mike Lofton, uh, Bob Cottingham, uh, some other people, Steve Marmando then. And I remember, we used to always say this, Keith, listen, you're getting good now. We have to fence every practice for beers. So the loser has to buy the beers. And Keith would say, now you got to realize we had good jobs. And Keith didn't have a job. Keith said, Peter, I can't do that. I don't have money. I said, Keith, we pay for your lessons. You need to tell your mother to get some money to pay for the beers. I said, Keith, now we're doing this for you. Keith, this is for you to understand how to deal with pressure. You got to understand this. So this is really for you. Keith, I'm going to tell you for the, Keith was furious 
One time he had the audacity to come with no money. I said, Keith, I'm going to lend you the money to go buy the beers if you lose and you pay me back. But Keith was always so, so, so upset with this. Another thing we used to have a, a thing, and Keith, I got to tell you now, it wasn't really to make you, we were really thirsty every night. You understand? <laughs> Another thing, we had a rule at the club that if you lose 7-0, you have to sit down. The shutout rule, remember? 7-0, you shut, you have to sit down. And the reason we did that, there were so many people that we just wanted to just have an assembly line. So when Keith would lose, we would send him upstairs. Now guys, upstairs, you gotta realize the only thing you could do upstairs at the fences club was a quart in the tears. You couldn't even make the head parry because if you made the repos, it would hit the ceiling. So Keith was so furious and insulted that we sent him upstairs. But this is an interesting thing that happens. Pretty soon, he got very good and very skilled. And next thing you know, we started buying the beers for Keith. Next thing you know, one time he said, Peter, it was 6-1. He said, Peter, no, it was 6-0. He said, Peter, remember, 7-0, you got to go upstairs. So, you know, I got to say, lady, I, ladies and gentlemen, I consider myself an honest guy, but I got to tell you now, Keith, I made sure Herbie cheated to make sure I didn't have to go upstairs. You understand? But now I want to say this. Out of all the accomplishments, Aaron, you graduated, you have an MBA from Wharton. Ivan, you are a police officer, a detective now. Keith, you have a graduate MBA from Columbia University. That's all nice and wonderful. You coming in, I remember at that time an American being number one in the world. Ivan, you were number one in the world. You're number one maybe six, eight months. That was amazing, but I have to say this. Again, the most important thing that impresses me is not his medals so much, like you, Vladimir, not so much the medals. It's not so much the degrees. What impresses me about Keith and Ivan and Aaron, they're there every Saturday teaching the kids, teaching the kids, teaching the kids. And we have an organization that every Saturday, the first three months, the first two months, we have about 220 people. There's too many people to deal with. All we can house is about 150 kids, about 150 kids. So I said, Keith, your job is to get rid of them, to try to do so much exercise to get rid of 50, 60 kids. So he does an outstanding job. Unfortunately, I have to say this, he started getting so excited that every September, the kids, two or three, would go to the emergency room. And Keith would tell me this, Peter, the guilty must suffer. That's what I used to tell him, the guilty must suffer. I said, Keith, I said that to you because you were poor and didn't have any money. We have money now. I can't, I do not want to get sued by people. So the guilty must not suffer now. So now, it's true. So now, he's a little easy. No one goes to the emergency room. And I just want to say this. I want to, I, I say, I congratulate you. I call you all my kids. Now, of course I know he's a grown man. I know that he's a grown, she's a grown woman. I understand that. But let me just say this. I love these kids so much. I love being in a room with all of you. I love being in a room with all of you. I don't see you all that much. But the bond that we have because of fencing, and I'm in so many venues. I'm in so many venues. I'm around people with so many money that donate so much money to our organization. But the bond that we have in fencing is very unusually special. You can go anywhere in the world and we still have a bond together. But getting back to you, I love you guys so much. You guys are, I know I call you kids, I know you're grown men and women, but let me tell you something, you will always be my kids. God bless you and congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Unfortunately, you're going to sit over and talk. Yeah. All right, well, thank you everyone. Truly, this is an honor. And as Ivan mentioned, you know, first I got to thank God because beyond my wildest dreams, I never thought I'd be here today. Like, if you really think about it, take a step back and go back 23 years. Three kids from Brooklyn, Flatbush, Brownsville, Brooklyn, taking the train every day for 60 to 90 minutes. And no one would have ever imagined that three kids from Brooklyn 
trust me, everybody on my block thought we were crazy. As Vladimir mentioned about his experience in Kansas City, very similar in the neighborhoods that we lived in. So to be speaking to you today is truly an honor, and I'm really blessed for what fencing has not only done for me and my family, Aaron, my aunt, and my cousin, but also the entire PWF family. Because as Peter mentioned, it's really a fraternity, a tight fraternity, and everybody in here has embraced us like we're family. So thank you so much for this honor. Um, you know, to be introduced by Peter is quite an honor. And being fencers, you have to be able to be quick on your feet. So candidly, I had a speech prepared. Spent a lot of time, because that's what you do as fencer. You build a game plan. But after hearing what seemed like a key smart roast, I got I to gotta change it up a bit. <laughs> now, uh, but, but truthfully, Pete, you know, those seven zip rules and the buying the beer, it really drove me nuts. And, but what he did for me and my friends and my family is in, immeasurable. Everybody knows his record, winning a medal in dry fencing. I can't, even, I can't even imagine what that was like. Except for Coach, he's the only one that can process that. But what was really impressive to me, and what I'm really, truly grateful for, is he started the PWF in the prime of his career. Literally, he start, started this organization while he was training for the Barcelona Olympics. And I know what it takes to train for an Olympics, and I can't even imagine taking on all these kids, because yes, I did advance like this, and I, had, I was very, very gangly, having the patience to deal with kids that know nothing about fencing and sacrificing money out of his pocket, literally out of his pocket, to make sure we were fencing on a level playing field. So, Pete, I'll always be grateful for what you've done for me, Aaron, and Ivan, and it's truly an honor. And I, and I don't want to take up too much time because uh, I know it's late and uh, the kids have to go to bed. I have a daughter that's two. And, we're very strict. As P Peter mentioned, I can be strict, and uh, I get it. So, uh, but I, one, of, one of the things that I want to say, though, is, you know, each one of you in this room has touched me either directly or indirectly. There are way too many people that I should name that I'd be remiss to like mention. But the the point is that I've um, I never really believed that. I could accomplish as much as I did. Um, until I, I was really blessed to run into three to four amazing coaches. Aaron and Ivan did a great job talking about what Eric Rosenberg did for us. Um, Alidar Kogler was my first coach. He recognized immediately that I shouldn't be in full because I was losing to Aaron every practice. So imagine that. <laughs> Older brother getting his butt beat in full by his younger sister, and yes, the trophies were disparaging, like hers were outweighed mine. But um, he said, look, you need to be in Sabre. And I joined Sabre, then had to go, go into the lines then every night with Peter and Bob and Mike and, and Ock and Herbie and I would have to fence upstairs because it was, it was a battle every night. And, uh, but it made us stronger. And then Yuri, you know, Yuri believed in me right when the point I really needed to be believed in. When he said that he wanted me to come to St. John's, I thought he was only being kind so he could get Aaron. That's what my parents thought too. Like, everybody thought that. <laughs> it was like, all right, yeah, you come to St. John's, yeah. Hopefully Aaron will come too. Like, everybody wanted Aaron. And I was always known as Aaron's uh, brother instead of Keith. Like, that, that was my name for, like, the first 10 years in the fencing world. But, uh, you know, what Yuri did was, like, he was like, no, I believe that you will be a great fencer. Come and work, and we'll go to the top. And he's not here tonight, but he really, he's always been there for me when I needed him, whether personally or professionally or athletically. And that's what you need in a good coach, somebody that's always there for you, regardless of how you do. And the same thing I should say about coach. 
Um, Coach is truly, truly an amazing man. I've known him since I was 15 or 16 years old, and he invited me out to Kansas City for camps before I deserved to be invited to Kansas City for camps. But he saw something, the kid that was losing, 6-0, first rounded all the time, but what it was just keep on fighting. So when he started inviting me out to KC for camps, it meant something to me, and I'm really grateful for him. And I know it was tough on his family, because we would go to Europe as teenagers for months, sometimes at a time. It would be Terrence, Aki, Jeremy, Herbie, and I. And that 97 national team, we were all juniors, 18 years old, Terrence, Jeremy, Aki, and I. And that was the first team I ever made. I never made any cadet team, so let's just uh, clarify any rumors right now. <laughs> Didn't make any junior teams either. But a uh, coach always believed that I can make an Olympic team. And he spent months just giving pep talks. And I wasn't scared of him. I was always fired up. And I, I love him because he believed in me so much. And, um, you know, in 2004, when I lost, for the medal, it was my fault. And I was scared. And I was afraid to admit that I was scared. So I lied to myself and I lied to my teammates. And afterwards, I was devastated, humbled, cried. But coach came up to me and I'd never seen him show emotion like that. And he was like, you know what? I know you were scared and you'll get back out there. And that meant so much to me and I'm so grateful for not letting me quit. And there's so many people that prevented me from quitting. Because I did quit. I walked away for an entire year. I thought I was cursed. And I didn't want anything to do with the sport. And what I realized was the sport is everything that you can ask for in life. Because at the end of the day, these are the people that will truly believe in you through thick and thin all your teammates and coaches. And um, what really pulled me back into the sport was when my dad died. And, you know, I needed something to focus on other than death. So coming back was really tough. But what was amazing is the entire federation, Carla May, Don, everyone, they acted like nothing was wrong, that I hadn't blown it and they were willing to give me another shot. And that I'm really grateful for, the second shot that everybody gave me. So thank you so much. Um, there's so many people that I want to thank, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time. So what I really want to just touch on is that this is truly a dream to be inducted in with Ivan and Aaron, two of my closest friends. Aaron's my best friend in fence, and we spent, as I mentioned, every day, two hours to three hours on the, on the subway. And as some of you may know, New York was pretty dangerous back then. So we would leave the kids in Brooklyn. There was a bunch of us, Rashawn Greenhouse, Terry, and some others. We'd all leave the club together because we were afraid of the kids from Harlem, where Aki lived, coming down. <laughs> so <laughs> we. We were like, all right, we're going to leave the club together. And we all take the train back to Brooklyn, where it was safe territory, because that's where our friends were. And uh, those hour-long conversations were some of the best conversations that I ever had, just talking about fencing. Ivan didn't participate because he always had his headphones on. Right, Aaron? <laughs> so I, it's amazing how loquacious he is tonight, because uh, Back then, he would just observe us as we were like just bantering around about the greatest fencers in the country, the greatest fencers in the world before you, there was internet. You know, we'd like read American fencing and see results and say, oh my gosh, what do you think they did? And every day, we just talk about fencing on the train. And that's where I really learned how special this sport is. Because after every practice, there's something new you have to work on. You're never perfect. So you always have something you have to focus on. And those skills that I learned as a teenager 
or things that I'm carrying with me today of, you know, you always have to focus, set big goals as a coach and Yuri used to always say, set the biggest goals that you can imagine. Anything is possible. No one would ever have imagined that Keith, who should have been cut from the foundation if it wasn't for Aaron, would be here accepting an award. It's beyond the realm of possibility back then. And the fact that, um, you know, Aaron and I, we won a silver after a pretty traumatic year. Like, a lot of, Aaron kind of gl glanced over it, but that year was very tough on her. Um, our mom died. We, were, we have a very close-knit family. I was in intensive care for two weeks with a blood disease. I, I was told I would never fence again prior to the Olympics. And because of fencers, I was able to get hooked up with the world specialist in, in, um, in, in, blood, in blood science. And they put me on like a, a crazy treatment that worked. And, um, you know, Erin, throughout that process, she kept us together when I wanted to, uh, you know, give up. So thank you so much. I um, want to thank my wife. She was there with me for a couple of those rides. My daughter, it's pretty safe to say she probably won't fence because I know how I was when I had fenced uh, guys that had their parents in it, and I, and I wanted to prove myself to them. So as a protective father, the last thing I want is for her to get beat up by the offspring of you guys in here. So. <laughs> so, and then, um, you know, my Aunt Carol, like, she's been really special. She traveled with us to all the Olympics and traveled to Beijing after her older sister died, which was really tough on my entire family. And she was the only one outside of my wife that we had family representation in China with my cousin. And it really meant a lot to this day. And I really thank her. And then, um, you know, just in closing, I want to thank all of the fencers that have ever touched my life. Um, there's way too many to list. All of the guys that are on the national team, some of them are here today, Sean, Jeremy, Terrence, Ock, Herbie, Bob Cottingham, who's still my mentor to this day, Felicia, the Zimmermans, Cliff Bayer. There's so many guys that really motivated me, like the Jacobsons, Marielle. You know, it's very rare when you could go to a World Cup win come home and realize you're not that good because you're training with guys that can beat you on any given day. And I had that every day thanks to Ivan, Aaron, Adam, all the guys at the Fences Club, the Foundation, MFC. You know, they kept me focused because they know, I knew that I couldn't settle because they were coming for me and I always had to be prepared. So um, it's been a great experience. I really thank everyone for voting for me, for voting for my family, for voting for coach. It's truly an honor, a day I'll never forget. And I hope everyone understands that uh, we all are truly blessed to be a part of USA Fenton because the sky's the limit. And uh, I'm just excited to watch the rest of this journey go on. Thank you so much. And now we're going to, Don Anthony will finish up with our uh, service awards. Thank you so much for joining us, <clears throat> joining me tonight for our Hall of Fame. I thank our committee, and uh, here's our president. Thank you, Andy. I know it's getting late, uh, but we ha this doesn't happen without the volunteers and the people who support our organization. And every year we want to recognize those who, are, uh, who have given to our sport, both long-term and short-term. Uh, our first award is the Ray Miller Award. And that award will be given this year 
to Mr. Branimir Ziskovich, who has done a million and one things to this for this sport. And we'll have an introduction by Mr. David Blake. All right, like, as Don said, we know it's getting late. Um, we have an interesting mix of people getting service awards this time. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's fantastic not only to, to recommend Ben for this uh, award, but also to be able to give it. Uh, I got my first fencing equipment from Ben Zivkovic, not only at that, but my first coaching job um, in the office in his, uh, at his house. On the wall, there are pictures of his new, uh, newly invented strips for the uh, Montreal Olympics. Um, there, are the, there are pictures of the first generation of the Lexan masks uh, from the 70s. Um, I remember fencing people with the second generation of those masks. Um, I had the opportunity to cut the holes in the, in the frames of the masks for the third generation ones that eventually became uh, FIE approved and were used for over 10 years. Um, ben has a lot of ideas. Uh, in a conversation we had a few months ago at his house, um, he said, how do we know if it's a good idea if we don't try it? Um, and I think that really says, says something about many of the things that you've tried. Um, and I think there are a lot of them that have impacted fencing uh, all along uh, and, and that, that we see every day. Um, so I think it's a long time coming. Certainly F the FIE has recognized you in this and it's about time that US Fencing does. So congratulations. I'll be very short, few minutes, because there is a group of people here that we always have and who brought a lot of their experience to the country, and I think I'm one of them as well. And I think when I give you my story, how I got into the United States, some of these people will remember their experiences as well. This is 1958, when I was living in Munich and working for a friend of mine. And one day I said, Johnny, that was his name, I want to go to the United States for, to participate in the World, Union, World Championships, which was held in Philadelphia. And he said, you are crazy. You're never going to get a visa, because in those days, if you get a visa for USA, you were a really extremely lucky person. Well, anyway, I was stubborn as always, including today. And I went to the consul's office in Munich, and uh, the counter there was a lady. Uh, in those days, uh, nickname of the ladies, if you called them Berta, that refers to that big gun that Hitler used to make at the northern part of the country. Actually, in English, that says the full full size figure. Anyway, so she said, what's all in there? What do you want? So I said, I would like to apply for the visa. She looked to me kind of, this guy must be crazy. I was a young guy, naturally. So she gave me the form to fill out. I filled out and I gave it to her. She says, okay, we'll call you. I said, no, 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 I need visa tomorrow. This was Tuesday. She says, you got to be kidding. No, no, I'm not kidding. I need visa tomorrow. So she laughed, called all other friends, and they all look at me. And, but I was repeating, I need visa tomorrow. She says, I'm going to call the consul. So the consul came in, young man. He was probably from Princeton or something like that. So I told him my story, and he listened politely. And he said, tell me one reason, why should, I give, why should we give you a visa for tomorrow? Well, I said, because uh, there is a world championships in Philadelphia, and the sponsor is the uh, President of the United States, Vice Eisenhower, and in his letter it says it guarantees visa to every single participant. I had a red passport at that time, so I look at me and he said, give me your passport. Well, I came back on Wednesday, I had my visa. So I got uh, now a problem, how should I fly to the United States? I had no money, a friend of mine said, I'll, I'll help you and all that. We did not have any 
technologies as of today, you know, to arrange and all that. So he had a friend who was in the travel business, so he made arrangements and the reply was, there is one seat on a KLM flight tomorrow on Thursday from Amsterdam to JFK, which was called Idelweid in those days. Well, being in Munich in those days and going to Amsterdam, it was kind of very impossible to reach the time when the flight is to, be take, to take off. I tried everything and I simply missed the flight. Well, KLM flight, which the entire Hungarian team took off, they all crashed and got killed except one passenger, which was me. So that's why I'm here today. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I knew no, no one in the United States at that time, especially in the fencing families. I landed in Boston, and the first question I got from the passport control officer is, did you get your shots? I said, what shots? In those days, you would have to have four shots at tetanus and many others. And the needle was, uh, when you see this needle, that was a weapon, that was not a needle. <laughs> well, I had to get my shots, I got it. I went somehow to Philadelphia. I was late on the first uh, entry in foil. I got the reaction from these uh, definitely four shots. And while fencing Epe on Saturday, there was a gentleman standing next on the strip and watching me fencing. Uh, my last bout in that particular pool was a big Italian guy. I'll tell you who he was in a minute. Well, when bout was over, this gentleman came over and he said, listen, if you ever come to New York, here is my address and the phone number. I live in Connecticut in Westport. Give me a call. Well, tonight this gentleman has received his Hall of Fame award. That was my first host, Ed V. Bell. And I went to his house where I ate very first American steak and all that, of course, and he took care of me. So, as you can see, all of a sudden our family extended its welcome to somebody who was an immigrant. But back in 1967, during the national championships in, in LA at a hotel called Alhambra, and you remember, I hope, I, I arrived late, not as a participant, but I, I wanted to see the country, so I drove all the way through. And I was late, there was a man, young man whom I already knew and uh, I, he said, where are you staying? I said, I have no room, nothing. He took his key out of his pocket and he said to me, this is your room. That was Mr. Carl Borak. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Regarding this award, which re reads service award. Well, yes, I'm very honored for that. Well. What I do mostly, I did, I'm a fencing coach too, as well as, well as master and so forth. Uh, I design fencing equipment, all kinds of fencing equipment today. I hold six FIE certificates on a fencing equipment that most of you are using and not even knowing that it comes from the United States. Now, there are more than 1,000 fencers in France that are fencing with my handles and many other countries in the world. But my very last customer, which happens this last uh, January, was from United, uh, from United Kingdom. I got a call from somebody and he said, we would like to buy one of your new strips. So I said, okay, and we made arrangements. Strip was being already sent there at the James College. Now, James College is sponsored by the Queen of England. She was my customer, believe it or not. She gave the money, and that's an American equipment in UK, regardless that many other companies are in Europe. So as you can see, we can do a lot of things, and we do. But we do have to really always keep in mind that we cannot just stay at one point. We must keep improving equipment, which brings better quality of fencing and everything else as, as much as that we can even imagine. Now, as I said a while ago, I'm very much honored that I received this award. 
And I will, in closing, simply say and use the words of the late Jackie Gleason, who said, how sweet it is. Thank you. Thank you, Maestro. I really appreciate it. The next award goes to Meredith and Ferdinand Delgado. It's the Jack Baker Award for service to USA Fencing. And to introduce them will be our executive director, Chris Ekron. One of the best parts of my job at USA Fencing is getting to work with our amazing, dedicated, and passionate volunteers. And I am so honored tonight to honor, to recognize two of our very best, Fernando and Meredith Delgado. When USA Fencing decided to bring a Sabre World Cup to Chicago, Meredith and Fernando Delgado were among the first people to step up and offer their help in putting together a major event. Meredith and Fernando helped to get volunteers, coordinated transportation, and Meredith even cooked and baked for the volunteers who were coming to the event. For the Delgados, putting on events has almost become second nature as the two have led the LOC for countless fencing tournaments over the years. In the early 90s alone, they helped put on JOs in 1990, nationals in 91 and 92, and more NACs than anyone can count. For Fernando, fencing has been part of his life since high school. But for Meredith, fencing came as a part of dating Fernando, and working on the bout committee was a solution to boredom. Nearly 40 years later, she can be found at almost every tournament, and this year has expanded her involvement in USA Fencing by serving on the nominating committee. Back at home, Fernando is the chair of the Illinois division, and Meredith is the division's treasurer. In addition, Fernando works with the USA Fencing as co-chair of the club's committee and is a member of the division and section resource group. For the Delgados, their commitment to fencing has become a family affair as vacations, birthdays, and anniversaries have all been spent at fencing tournaments, often with some or all of their four children in tow. Please join me in congratulating Meredith and Fernando Delgado as this year's honorees for the Jack Baker Award for service to USA Fencing. I was gonna say, Fernando doesn't always like to talk, but of course, those who know me. <laughs> so I will keep this short. Um, actually, about 40 years ago, about this time, I went on either my second or third date with Fernando, and he says, by the way, we just have to stop somewhere first. And I went to my first AFLA meeting, <laughs> and uh, the rest is kind of history. Um, Fernando has taken on a lot of committing us to, um, fencing tournaments and such, and the night after we went home after completing the 91 Nationals at Pheasant Run, he says, remind me not to do this again. <laughs> Two months later, when Florida had a back out of the 92 Olympic trials, Nancy Anderson calls me late one night, and he's out coaching his college team, and he comes home, and I, he says, anybody call? And I said, Nancy called. He says, yes, and I said, they want us to host the 92 Olympic trials. He goes, you didn't tell her no, did you? And I said, no, I'll let you do that, but of course we ended up doing that. So yes, countless, countless athletes and referees and FOC and everything have come into our lives, and we have raised our four children in the fencing community. Um, so we can't count that number. But I can tell you that at least four days a month and 12 days every summer, we spend our lives with most amazing people. And people say, why do you do this? Fernando and I both can say we do it for the love of the sport. So thank all of you for being part of our lives too. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith and Fernando. Uh, we appreciate all that you do, and 
I personally can say I've had the opportunity to be hosted many times throughout my career and afterwards, so thank you. Our next award, which will be the final award of this evening, will be given to Jerry Baumgard. <laughs> Jerry has been nominated by her peers for the FOC Service Award, and she will be introduced by Miss Sharon Everson. Come on up, Sharon. Jerry didn't know that I was going to be giving this award. Jerry and I have been roommates at NAX for the last, oh, 15, 20 years. She's the only one who can stand, uh, stand me in the room, uh, rooming with me. She's trained me well. And it is my sincere honor to be introducing her for this award tonight. Uh, Jerry began refereeing because it was expected that if you competed, you would referee. That was back in the days, folks, I'm sorry, fencers, that we're, you actually had to referee before you got to fence. You guys would never understand anything about that. And as she says, you would either get better at refereeing or you would get booted out of the gym, which is what happened. She was originally a foil fencer who started fencing because she was bored after moving to Colorado and needed a hobby. Jerry later picked up the epee, which became her new love, both as a fencer and as a referee. Jerry ultimately became involved in USA Fencing, both as an official and as chair of bout committees. If you haven't seen her on a bout committee, uh, she's everywhere, rocks, SYCs, and she's been doing that for at least the last 30 years. Jerry's talent in refereeing was recognized by the FIE when she became the first woman to earn an A rating in any weapon. This was unheard of in the FIE for a woman to have a rating at all. And then to have an A rating was amazing. Jerry had also had the honor of not only being selected as a referee for the Atlanta Olympic and Paralympic Games, but she was also chosen to officiate the team EPE gold medal finals at the Olympic Games. Jerry, Jerry continues to give back to USA Fencing as a referee at national championships and North American Cups and ROCKS, as I've mentioned, and has been instrumental in increasing the number of referee seminars around the country, as well as bringing seminars to the summer nationals. She teaches them. She hires for them, she organizes them, she is the chair of the uh, Fencing Officials Commission's grassroots roots, uh, training program, and so she is instrumental in bringing referees uh, into the organization. She has trained innumerable EPE referees, myself included, who went to EPE kicking and screaming as a foil referee. EPE was, you know, EPE. You know, we get to watch the floor. And I have to tell you honestly that refereeing gold medal bouts and team championships and, and Olympic final, and national finals is nothing compared to standing there in a really, really good epi bout. It just gives me fits. Uh, and Jerry would say, did you make any calls? I got to make a lot of calls in epi. Uh, those floor touches gave me fits. But it is my distinct pleasure right now and my honor to present the Fencing Official Commission's Service Award to my friend and NSA roommate, Jerry Baumgart. Ms. Baumgart. Thank you so much. This is very much appreciated and an honor. And this woman, I have been a roommate with her since Saturday of last, whenever last week came, has not said a word. I was given the option of two tickets, for one for myself and one for a, a friend. And I even invited her to come to this. <laughs> affair, you know, so that uh, she could be here with me. So I guess I've been done in the fact that uh, she kept it all a secret. Um, so it, this has really been great. And one, I'll tell you something that's really exciting. I've done a lot of wonderful things. Fencing has been very good to me. I have traveled the world, which is fabulous. 
One of the proudest moments was earlier this week, <clears throat> excuse me, when five of the kids that I have worked with from Colorado are here refereeing at the Summer Nationals. From, from, ref, from fencing through a couple of the ranks of referees and that they are here, they're doing a great job and I am so pleased. And truly, I know you all are saber people, but Epe is a fabulous weapon as well. <laughs> great Epe is as comfortable as great saber. So thank you all. Thank you, Jerry. I want to thank all of our Hall of Fame inductees for being here and all the great contributions you've made to fencing. Those who are here, Vladimir, Aaron, Ivan, Keith, thank you so much. Thank you so much for those who make all of our service. And with that, we will conclude the award ceremony for this year and our inductions. And I look forward to seeing you next year. And thank you for all the support for our organization.